Next, a hearing on California's energy shortage. Last week, the House Government Reform Subcommittee held the first of three field hearings in the matter. Among the panels of witnesses who testified in Sacramento on Tuesday included officials from the California Public Utility Commission, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the California League of Food Processors, and the state's independent system operator. You'll now hear from the first two panels in this five-hour hearing, chaired by California Congressman Doug Osi. Come to order. I ask you now to consent that all members and witnesses' written opening statements be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that members of Congress who are not members of the committee be allowed to participate in today's hearing. Without objection, that's agreed to. I ask unanimous consent that all questions submitted in writing to the witnesses and their answers be included in the hearing record. And I ask unanimous I ask unanimous consent that questioning in this matter proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the chairman and ranking minority member allocate time to members of the committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning, not to exceed 60 minutes equally divided between majority and minority. Without objection, so ordered. <coughs> I want to welcome everyone to the first of three hearings we will be holding on the California energy crisis. Judging by the turnout here today, I think we can safely say that this is a crisis that is on the mind of everyone in California and around the country. I'm hopeful that these hearings will bring about an honest discussion of our problems and produce some agreeable resolutions to this crisis. I especially want to thank Chairman Burton for allowing the committee the opportunity to conduct these hearings in California. Although Chairman Burton is from Indiana, I think we'll find that resolving California's energy crisis is vital to the economic well-being of the entire country. I also want to thank all the other members of Congress who've made the journeys to Sacramento, in particular Chairman Horn from Long Beach. I look forward to your ideas and participation. The availability, reliability, and price of power are an integral part of our economic and social success. The converse of that statement is also true. An unavailable, unreliable, and expensive source of power will cause an economic and social crisis. And to be sure, this is a crisis. Few public policy issues affect consumers as much as energy. Higher energy prices and the threat of blackouts affect all Californians. California consumers will be faced with higher energy prices that will cause real hardship to low-income families and those living on fixed incomes. I'm especially concerned about those who share a home with numerous extended family members. These families will be held to the same energy baseline use standards as a typical nuclear family, even though they could have two or three times as many people living under the same roof. Consumers will also pay more for products they purchase, as businesses are forced to pass on higher energy costs to their consumers. I'm deeply concerned that seniors living on fixed incomes will have to choose between air conditioning or costly medicines in the summertime or eating or, or heating in the winter. Either choice could be deadly. In addition, as a result of the crisis, consumers will pay more in the form of squandered surpluses resulting in higher taxes and cuts in government programs such as education, law enforcement, health care, and tax relief. And I just want to point out the San Francisco Chronicle this morning had an article that listed the daily expenditures for uh, anti-smoking, for an algebra education, for the war on amphetamine on a comparative basis to what we're spending unanticipatedly, if that's such a word, for power. Businesses will also face increased costs as a result of this crisis. The cost of doing business in California is already very high relative to the surrounding states, but I am fearful that high energy costs will drive more businesses out of California because many of the small businesses here right now 
will be unable to pass on higher costs or relocate. The losses of good jobs and tax revenues because of the energy crisis are grave concerns for me. Intel Corporation, for instance, has stated very clearly that they will no longer invest in California, citing an unfriendly business climate and uncertainty as to the supply of a reliable source of power. Let's also not forget that the California agricultural industry is being devastated by high natural gas prices and must brace for massive increases in their electricity bill. As you know, most farmers operate on very tight margins. They simply will not be able to absorb the price hikes in both natural gas and electricity. Clearly, high energy prices will have a large negative effect on the California economy and could possibly drag the rest of the nation into a recession. But there is something even worse than high energy prices, and that's blackouts. Just last week, as reported by the LA Times, experts were predicting over 30 days of blackouts this summer. And where blackouts occur, disaster follows. Long-term blackouts this summer will endanger lives, especially for our seniors. We've already seen this happen in Chicago during the summer of 1998. People of fragile health who live in the deserts and valleys of California will be extreme risk when the blackouts hit. Blackouts wreak havoc on businesses as well. Tomato farmers in the third congressional district tell me that if a processing plant is shut down due to a blackout, that is power is cut off without any explanation or anticipation, they lose the entire product that's being processed, and then have to shut down for days to clean and sanitize the plant. The same is true in Silicon Valley, where chip makers could lose millions of dollars if they are hit with a single blackout. Another example, we will hear more from Mr. Verboom later, is the dairy industry. If a dairy farm is hit with a blackout, you can't milk your cows. Now, I don't know about you, but it's my understanding, if you don't milk a cow, you got a problem especially if that cow's ready to be milked. These are but a few examples of a problem that will occur among many industries statewide when blackouts hit. The purpose of this hearing is to seek input on as to what role the federal, state, and local governments have in creating a solution for this energy crisis. Some of the questions I hope to answer are, what measures have been taken by the state of California to solve this crisis? In the wake of PG&E's bankruptcy filing, does the governor have a new plan? Has the Bush administration been responsive to requests from the state of California? What federal regulatory measures can be taken to help ease the current crisis? And finally, what is the prospect for a solution in the near term and in the long term? I want to thank all the witnesses for coming today. I know it's tough to make time for this stuff. I am looking forward to hearing from everyone because they each have a unique perspective that's important to our discussion. I'm hopeful that together we can shed some light on what Californians can expect this summer and take some necessary steps to ensure that California's energy concerns are finally put behind us. And now I would like to recognize uh, my colleague, Mr. Burton, for the purpose of his opening statement. nice to be in California. It's here is a beautiful day. And I, uh, I'm sorry you're having this problem. Uh, chairman Osi is chairman of our new subcommittee on energy and regulatory affairs, and he'll be uh, watching and, and working on this problem over the coming months and, and, and hopefully coming months, not more than a year. Uh, for the last year, we've held a series of hearings on energy policy. We held a hearing last summer on gasoline price spikes in the Midwest. We held another hearing in the fall on the problems with home heating oil and natural gas. <coughs> we have real problems in those areas. And we don't have all the answers, but as a result of the hearings we've already held, we've been able to draw at least some conclusions. First, we need to develop our natural gas resources. We have tremendous deposits of natural gas in this country but many of them are closed to development. Almost all of the new electricity plant plants being built now are run by natural gas because it's clean. Demand is going up, as it is here in California, but new sources of supply are not being developed. 
the price of natural gas has more than tripled, and that's passed on in the form of higher utility rates. This has created severe hardships on lower income families. There are many areas that can be opened up to development without endangering the sensitive environments, and we need to do it, and we need to do it now because it'll help here in California as well. <coughs> we have to develop more refinery capacity. In 1982, there were 231 oil refineries in the United States. Today, there are only 155. The demands we're placing on them is straining them to the breaking point. Because of all the environmental laws we have, refineries have to produce more than 50 different blends of gasoline for different seasons and regions of the country. And that's an amazing burden. We're stretched so thin that all it takes is one disruption in a pipeline or a refinery to cause chaos. That's what happened in the Midwest last summer, and that's why they ended up paying more than $2 a gallon for gasoline. The restrictions we have that make it so difficult to build new refineries are so counterproductive. Refineries built 20 or 30 years ago are dirty and inefficient. With today's technology, cleaner, more environmentally safe refineries could be built to replace them, but it's just not economical. And that has to change. We need to have good, strong environmental laws, but we have to weigh the costs and the benefits. The new diesel fuel rule being developed by the EPA is a good example. Everyone agrees that diesel fuel needs to be cleaned up. The oil industry has offered to a plan to remove 90% of the sulfur that's now in diesel fuel, 90%. Well, that's pretty good, but the EPA won't accept that. They're insisting on 95%, and yet experts are predicting that the extreme measures they'll have to take to get to that extra 5% are going to cause serious disruptions in our energy markets, and that will affect California as well. I think that decision needs to be revisited. I think we have enough problems to deal with without creating new ones. So we've learned a lot through this process, but we have yet to do a thorough review of the problems we have with electricity. And that's why we're here this week. If you want to learn about the pitfalls of electricity policy, California is the place to be. This is the laboratory, and the experiment is not going very well. We're not here to assign blame. We're not here to point fingers. We're here to listen and to learn and to try to find out ways that we might be of assistance. There's going to be an important debate in Congress this year on energy policy. We haven't had a serious energy policy in this country for too long. The Bush administration is going to offer a plan. Bills are now being introduced. We have some important decisions to make, whether we're going to take the steps that are necessary to have energy independence and reliable supplies, or whether we won't. And that's why these hearings are so timely. This is such an important issue that we created a new sub subcommittee this year, and I just mentioned that, uh, the Subcommittee on Energy Policy and Regulatory Affairs. And I asked Mr. Osi to be the chairman of that committee, and I asked him to chair today's hearing. He's made this a top priority, and I think uh, he, that's justified, and I think he'll do a great job. There are a lot of different issues for us to look at this week, and I'll just mention a few. Why has demand grown so rapidly in California and supply grown so slowly? Were there early warning signs of this crisis that were missed, and if so, what were they? Should the federal government place a cap on electricity prices, or will this inhibit investment in new plants and exploration? Why weren't long-term contracts locked in when prices were lower? Have power generators made excessive profits, and should they be ordered to repay some of that money? How are the utilities going to pay off their massive debts? We've just seen one company declare bankruptcy. Will there be more? Over the next three days, we're going to hear from all sides of this debate. Hopefully, by the end of the week, we'll have answers to at least some of these questions. Today, we're going to focus on the state government's role in handling the crisis. We're also going to look at how the U.S. Interior Department might be contributing to some of the problems. Tomorrow, we're going to hear from the major utilities and the alternative energy producers. We'll also question the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission about their role. On Thursday, we're going to have the major electricity producers, and we'll have a lot of questions for them. I want to thank all of our witnesses who are here today. 
we have some representatives from the local agricultural sector. I know they're having serious problems. Mrs. Lynch from the Public Utilities Commission had to rearrange her schedule to be here today, and we appreciate that. And to all our other witnesses whom I haven't mentioned, I want to thank you for being here as well, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. My good friend from Long Beach, I'd like to recognize Mr. Horn for the purposes of an opening statement. I thank the gentleman. I want the people of Northern California to know that in Mr. Osi, they have a first-class legislator. He's been a very all uh, at everything we've done in a hundred different hearings last year. Mr. Osi was there, and uh, he asks first-rate questions. And I'm going to wave an opening statement because I happen to believe in asking for the questions, not talking myself. And the chairman of the full committee has spoken for all of us. So thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Horn. All right, where are you? This committee swears its uh, witnesses in, so we're going to have the three of you rise. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Let the record show the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I would ask that you summarize your, your written statement. <clears throat> Try and keep it under five minutes. Mr. Yates, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Horn, Mr. Burton, good morning. I am Ed Yates, Senior Vice President of the California League of Food Processors. The food processing industry in California is sizable. It accounts for 40% of the nation's domestic supply of processed fruits and vegetables. It is totally reliant upon an ample and adequate supply of energy to process the 16 million tons, 16 million tons of perishable fruits and vegetables, converting that perishable product into safe and storable products available to con consumers across the country at any time they wish to use them. The current crisis in California is having a profound impact and presents a significant challenge to the food processing industry in California. We are facing rolling blackouts this summer. Our estimate is at least 30. These are extremely disruptive for a process, as Mr. Osi pointed out, where it may take, due to a one or two hour outage, 24 to 36 hours to bring the plant back online. That represents as high as 24,000 tons of food that either gets thrown away or does not get processed. We have no protection currently from rolling blackouts unless you wish to shed some load and participate in those kinds of programs. Again, I want to emphasize the importance of supply. We are facing the prospect of having natural gas supplies curtailed or seized by utilities in California. The prospect of that is more than scary. We would not be looking at a one or two hour period of downtime like a blackout. We're talking days and maybe weeks of unavailable supply of natural gas. We're also extremely concerned about the price of natural gas. Currently, the price is above $12 a decatherm. That translates to almost a billion dollars more in natural gas costs to the food processing industry if those prices were to prevail and be applied to everyone. We have a unique problem in California with the price of delivery of gas to the border. It exceeds the price of the commodity. We're also very concerned with the effect in California that we have in competing with the electric generation industry. We compete with them on two levels. One for the price of the commodity 
and secondly, for delivery. As the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has opened up interstate pipelines to some reasonable form of competition, it's whomever can pay the most appears to get the highest priority for delivery. The food processing industry being a relatively low margin industry simply cannot compete with the prices that electric generators can pay for the commodity or delivery. Food processors, I describe it this way. We are in a stainless steel straitjacket. We want the tools necessary to help ourselves get through this crisis. Yet in California, the very stringent regulations for air pollution and other considerations ex extremely limit our ability to help ourselves. We are making initiatives for alternative fuels. We're not getting a very open ear for that. Uh, we're simply locked into natural gas as a supply. We did in our prepared testimony make four recommendations uh, for consideration at the federal level. We believe that the provisions of the Natural Gas Policy Act back in the old days, which provided for a high priority for essential agricultural and food processing use of natural gas ought to be revisited, restored, and extended to the burner tips of food processors in California. We think that incentives ought to be created that would promote the use of alternative fuels for boilers and backup generation. We believe that uh, someone ought to discover whether or not the high wholesale electric prices are reasonable and acceptable in terms of fair pricing and competition. We do support competition as long as it is fair and uh, equitable and everyone has an opportunity to participate. We're in a symbiotic relationship with the grower community. We expect a number of processors may shut down this season uh, and we are hoping for some remedies to be forthcoming. And with that, I close and again, appreciate very much the opportunity to make these remarks today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yates. I was remiss in introducing Mr. Yates as a senior vice president of the California League of Food Processors, for which I apologize. The, our second witness is Mr. Peter Verboom, who is a dairyman from the great county of Glen County in my district. Mr. Verboom, you're recognized for five minutes. It's on. It's on? Yes. Uh, my name is Peter Verboom. Uh, I'm actually relocating my dairy from San Diego County to Glen County. I'm in the process, and I have to apologize. I did not bring my written statement if that's okay. Arrest this man. <laughs> uh, being from San Diego County, uh, we faced uh, last July when the San Diego County, San Diego Gas and Electric went on deregulation. And my cost on my dairy facility in San Diego County tripled. They went from 3,500 a month to over 10,000 a month. And there's no way that we can pass on those costs with our milk prices being controlled. We cannot pass on the wholesale uh, milk prices to our, uh, our, our regulated by the state where the retail prices are not. And so we have no way of passing on those costs through our product. And so we have to absorb them. It don't work, especially given the cost of milk prices as they have been in the last year. And uh, being from uh, moving my facility to northern, I'm in the process, actually. We were moving cows last night at midnight. And uh, we're in the process of moving our herd up. And so I will be able to get a clear picture of the difference between SDG and E and PG&E, and uh, I'm kind of wondering what to expect. <laughs> and so it's been, uh, as far as the having 
uh, the power at the dairy. We do have generation facilities at the dairies. But uh, on the other hand, uh, in the, this past year, in the rolling blackouts that we've had, uh, we've had, uh, I produce milk for Landa Lakes. And uh, Landa Lakes has a large facility in Tulare. And in Tulare, with the brownouts, they, their milk backed up on them. And when the milk backed up, they were not able to pick it up at the dairies. And a certain amount of dairies had to dump their milk. And then also faced the possibility of regulations from the uh, Water Quality Control Board for contaminating the groundwater. And so uh, it's been a problem uh, it kind of just feeds on itself all the way down the line. But my initial uh, statement is that we, as a, as, an, as a producer, I have no way to pass it on. And, uh, and so I wanted to re relate that message to you. And With the, with the milk storage problems, and we can't, that's basically my opening statement. I, uh, I, I'll be open for questions. I'm sorry I did not have a prepared statement with me. Sorry. Thank uh, you, Mr. Verboom. Yeah. Our third witness is Lou Euler, who is the president of the National Tax Limitation Committee, lives in this area. Welcome. Thank you, Congressman, and uh, Congressman Burton and Horn. Uh, Thank you for inviting us to uh, <clears throat> do our best to represent uh, the viewpoint of taxpayers here in California. We're a national committee. We keep our headquarters uh, here in the Sacramento area with uh, tens of thousands of members in this state and elsewhere. And we've been in, in operation for the last 25 years. And I'm proud to say we do not accept any government grants or contracts, federal, state, local, or whatever, but only are supported by voluntary contributions of taxpayers. The gravity of this situation is lost on no one. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the uh, electric and other energy situation we face now is the result of a flawed deregulation program. Uh, frozen rates, uh, uh, requirements that uh, uh, electrons be purchased uh, on the spot market rather than in long-term contracts, a peculiar method of financing uh, the uh, daily or hourly requirements by paying everybody the highest rate paid to any provider instead of a blended rate with some of the lower cost being blended in to bring that down. So we confronted a huge substantive and for the politicians and the governor a political situation and uh, <clears throat> rather than uh, uh, accepting uh, the reality of the problem and choosing a market-based solution, the governor and uh, the majority leaders of the legislature have chosen a command economy approach to the solution. And in doing so, they have um, opted to put the burden of this not on the ratepayers, but on the taxpayers of the state. Now, there is some overlap, of course, but since 25% of the generation in the state is by municipal utilities who were not caught up in the stupidity of the deregulation plan and its execution, they bear a different rate structure than others do. And yet they're being asked as taxpayers to uh, bear some of this burden, I think mainly because they have been around and they are credit worthy and uh, so what the political process in Sacramento has been doing is looking for credit worthy uh, people to turn to, hence the public fisc and the public treasury, which is now obligated in tens of billions of dollars for current and forward uh, electricity costs. From this moment forward, we have a chance to improve the situation. And I would remind us that we ought to be guided by the medical Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. And yet yesterday, the governor entered into further harm by proposing, and of course the legislature will dispose, but by proposing that the uh, people of the state wearing their taxpayer's hat should purchase a 
antiquated uh, uh, grid system from part of the electricity distribution system. Uh, so it appears that the governor is not learning. Uh, he is uh, creating a further nightmare for the taxpayers. Um, and we should have learned from the decline of the Soviet uh, Union that command economies don't work, free markets do, and that we've got to adopt free market solutions. So the real answers, I think, here are twofold. First, let's turn to, I would urge this very, very significantly for the state, and there's, a, there's relevance for you at the federal level here, and that is that we turn to the truly creditworthy buyers, the individual residential uh, uh, consumers, the businesses, cities, and all the rest, and use their credit, let their credit be used to buy electricity directly from the suppliers, negotiating contracts to benefit themselves. Now, when we started this crazy deregulation, we had limited direct access. Less than 2% of the residential users opted for uh, alternative suppliers. Why? Because there was no price differentiation, because we froze the rates asked for by the utilities, so they've caused this problem that is now visited on them to a large degree. In terms of the industrial and commercial users, as many of the, as, as uh, 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 old 25 to 27 percent of the larger users actually entered into direct access. When the state passed AB1X, so-called Relief Act here, they stop the opportunity for direct access. So one of the things we must do is to reverse that action and give all of us, give these gentlemen here, the opportunity to go directly to Enron or Reliant or whomever they can make a deal with and make the best deal they can and get their supply. That may not stop blackouts, but they can also negotiate contracts, multiple areas with the possibility of limiting the blackouts at least during this time. Secondly, as with in retailing, there are three things that are important, location, location, and location. There are three things that are important in solving this problem, supply, supply, and supply. And what we've got to do is get more power out of existing generators. As our friend who uh, runs the uh, California League of Food Processors, Ed Yates, has said, uh, we, we simply are being inundated with rules and regulations by local uh, air quality control management districts that have to be disciplined into some kind of a system. And we call on the governor. He must ask Washington, must ask you for re uh, relaxation of the clean air uh, uh, rules. In turn, uh, uh, under his emergency authority, relax the uh, Clean Air Act requirements here in the state of California discipline the local air quality management uh, crowd into some kind of a system and, uh, and get them to produce and continue to produce. And then, of course, we need to build a whole slug of new facilities, nuclear, hydro, et cetera. And I would urge that the Auburn Dam be one of those considered for the long-term benefit of this state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Euler. <clears throat> we'll now uh, entertain questions from the members. We're going to do this in 10-minute sections. I'm going to recognize the gentleman from Indiana first for 10 minutes. Let me start with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Verboom. Uh, you said that uh, Lando Lakes, which is a purchaser of milk products from you, one of your larger milk purchasers, because of the blackouts, they had to they had milk spoil. Yes. And they had to dump it. And when they dumped it, then they ran into an environmental problem because of the pollution of water supply. Let me back up there. Uh, they actually, the plant itself did not dump the milk. They lost the capacity to bring in any more milk from the dairies. And so the dairies had to the dump. The dairies had to dump the milk. And so all the dairy producers were then in violation of uh, yes. environmental rules. Uh, and you said your, your, your rate in San Diego went up 300 uh, percent? Uh, it three times. multiplied three times, yes. Okay, so, so is that the main reason you're relocating uh, north? No, I was in the process of relocating, mm -hmm. uh, but it has become a very good reason to, <laughs> to uh, uh, San Diego County 
uh, where we were located uh, mm -hmm. is not very conducive to dairies. But and you say that, 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 that there's a ceiling on the wholesale price uh, set by the state, so you have to eat the loss. Yes. When you have to destroy milk or, or get rid of milk, that's yeah. Well, it gets uh, Land of Lakes being a cooperative, mm -hmm. it gets distributed amongst all the producers, so all the producers bear the loss. Okay, but also the uh, the electrical cost. Uh, also, you have to eat that. I you? have to eat that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, because definitely. Because of the because of the price ceilings. Yes. It sounds like there's other problems besides just generation of electricity you have to deal with there. Yeah. Um, Mr. Yates, you said. Uh, uh, that uh, alternative fuels should, should be allowed to be used, but there was a problem with uh, uh, environmental laws in the state. Could you elaborate just a little bit on that? Thank you. Uh, in California, there are standards for the use of alternative fuels. However, the, the problem is if you were to put in the equipment to utilize those fuels and they happen to result in an increase of emissions, you have to, before you can install the equipment, make arrangements to offset that increase of emissions. We think that we're not asking that those requirements be eliminated. We simply ask that more time be allowed to acquire those emission offsets rather than to have having to do them up front. Mm -hmm. Alternate fuels have historically been an effective and very viable means of fighting high costs for natural gas. The air regulations in the states have been, in California, have been tightened up. So many food processors have lost their ability to utilize alternative fuels and natural gas has been plentiful reasonably priced and so there was no need obviously there's a need now to and look utilities are using a lot of that natural gas that's correct as i'd mentioned there is an increasing demand mm -hmm. not only by the utilities to satisfy what they call the core which are residences and small businesses but also electric generation all those loads are are increasing mm -hmm. and we set with the high probability that the utilities could seize our gas to satisfy the needs of the core group. In addition, the Public Utilities Commission in California has proposed a rulemaking which would give electric generators higher priority than we have for which, natural gas supply. Which, which, Does us no good to have a supply of electricity if we have no gas to process the food. So you think you should be treated equally uh, along with the utilities? At minimum. Yeah. That's correct. Let me ask one more thing, one more question of you, and that is uh, uh, we have tremendous natural gas supplies in the country, but because of stringent environmental rules and regulations, a lot of those areas have not been able to be tapped. Do you believe that uh, we ought to uh, take another look at uh, going after those uh, reserves that we have of natural gas in this country? Yes, I do. I, I think all efforts should proceed with all speed, including the potential of gas supplies in California. I do not believe that the potential for gas production in California has been either fully identified nor exploited. Uh, we hear the numbers that there's a 50 to 60 year supply of natural gas in this country to meet demand. Uh, we think we would come to the conclusion that there's plenty of gas, it's a matter of getting to it to, to satisfy our and needs. And through your research, have you found that uh, that could be uh, garnered in an environmentally safe way? Uh, I believe that's uh, very possible. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Euler, uh, you said that uh, the purchasers who are having a difficult time need to be able to have uh, direct access uh, to, to the supply of electricity. Uh, they can't do that now because of state regulation? Well, what happened, uh, Congressman, was when the uh, regulation plan was first implemented, why uh, <clears throat> some commercial users were given the opportunity, but meaningful direct access to residential users 
was denied because of the uh, uh, cost or, or imposed rate structure uh, that was uh, uh, that was imposed by the Public Utility Commission. So while Enron came in, Commonwealth, many others came in and sought to uh, market their uh, energy directly to the homeowner, thereby using much in the same way as the long line telephone effort mm -hmm. has gone with AT&T, Sprint, and everybody else in competition. Uh, because of the uh, 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 imposed rate uh, uh, control, why uh, a very small percentage of the people actually signed up. With AB1X passed in January here in the state, uh, that direct access was foreclosed for all users. Why was that? Why did they uh, do that? It beats me. Uh, this is another, in other words, what happened here in California in the, in the kind of a global sense is when the crisis arose and we had an opportunity to uh, use market principles and buy long term and that sort of thing, the apparent mental state and outlook of the political leadership of this state uh, being essentially central planners opted for a command economy approach uh, and decided to take over yeah. and run the thing their way. I understand you said that earlier. Yeah. Do you think that that, that, uh, that should be changed so that... Uh, Absolutely must be changed and, and I can only say that um, uh, one of the things that is so distressing in yesterday's announcement about the deal with uh, Southern California Edison, why um, uh, the one of the things that was taken off the table was future development of hydroelectric properties owned by Southern California Edison, further evidence that this administration will not confront the environmental, uh, the hardliners in the environmental community here in California and go for it in terms of relaxing the rules that will help our food processors and our dairy people, but help everybody. Give, unshackle us. We're, oh, okay. we're, we have, our hands are tied. I can Let see. us out. I can. Let us have direct access I, and we'll make our own deals. I can see your enthusiasm <laughs> and you were getting into my next question. And that is, uh, is that a relative of yours back there? <laughs> No, we well, brought no relatives here I, I, this well, morning. You have, you have some supporters. <laughs> Let me just ask you this, you, you, and you were touching on this as I interrupted you there, and I apologize. You said increase production of uh, the uh, supply of energy uh, by uh, relaxing some of the clean air rules, at least uh, for a period of time, I guess is what you were saying. Uh, over over the, the long haul, you are for strong environmental standards, though. Yes, whether these are good or bad is for uh, but you're talking the future. About the sh you're talking about in the short run. I'm talking about in the short run, okay. well, both let, let the federal follow. clean air. Let me follow up, sure. and we can look at that at the, at the federal level. But uh, in, in, in the long run, uh, and I, I'll address this question to all three of you. I see my time's running out. Uh, do you believe that uh, 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 an adequate supply of energy can be produced uh, here in California uh, and this region in an environmentally safe uh, way so that uh, even though the rules might be relaxed in the short run, uh, if there's proper free market principles installed, that we would be able to uh, have uh, uh, an adequate amount of energy created to take care of the needs of California in an environmentally safe way. There's not even the slightest question. And if we turn to nuclear, which we know France now produces 75% of its domestic electricity through nuclear plants and does it safely. Uh, this uh, terror uh, on the part of some environmentalists about nuclear is, uh, is misplaced. We should have, and we should reopen some nuclear plants that have been mothballed if we can do it quickly and, uh, and properly. And hydro uh, is, of course, the cleanest and safest and also conserves our water, which is the next infrastructure problem the state faces. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> if I might just uh, offer one observation. It would help us to have yes or no or I don't know answers to questions and then a very clear statement and then do the expanding on the responses. So, Mr. Horn, for 10 minutes. 
Uh, just uh, one uh, to Mr. Euler on the natural gas situation. We've got the natural gas. Uh, the question is, can we get it in the pipelines in the right places of the state? What do you know about the pipelines in Northern California? I have no specific technical knowledge. Uh, I know they're trying to fill those pipelines with um, increased pressure at night to increase the storage that otherwise is unavailable. Um, but uh, beyond that, I don't have the technical knowledge. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to get the appropriate uh, group that represents natural gas to get those answers to this part of the state and to the degree to which they clean the pipes, as you say, uh, in the evening, and they put other things through there. But uh, let's get it at this point in the record, if Without I might. Objection. Uh, number two, Mr. Yates, uh, it's a truly amazing the uh, hundred per se uh, percentages you have with uh, pears and apricots and strawberries and peaches. We've got another problem, and that's what's gone at the roots of some of those. And I just wondered if you know uh, off the top of your head uh, the degree to which those trees are dying. And uh, do you happen to have any information on that? Pardon me, what uh, specific crop are well, you Well, in terms to? of the roots with the peaches, the grapes, so forth. Oh, the, the disease in the exactly. uh, grape yeah. community, uh, that's right. a huge problem. It's creating some shifts in uh, producing areas, severe economic losses, and those sorts of things. Mr. Chairman, I'd like that put on the record at this point. Without objection. Thank you. I yield back questions. The gentleman yields back. If I might uh, follow up on a couple of things. Mr. Verboom, you're moving your dairy from San Diego County to Glen County. Uh, yes. I know it's in a, you don't ask a cattleman how many head he has, but you have a production of how many truck loads per day? We produce one truck load of milk per day. Okay. Now how many people work at your dairy? Uh, at home, we have 11. On the new facility, we'll have about 18. If you can't get power and you have to dump your milk or you can't plan for, with any degree of certainty, what happens to those jobs? Well, the cows have to be milked and fed. There's no getting around it. So, uh, like I said, we had backup facilities, but being able to ship the milk to the plant has been the problem. How long can you warehouse the milk on your dairy? One day. So you have a one-day window to yes. hold the milk before you have to move it. Yes. And if I understand correctly, it's the Gonzales milk pool pricing system that uh, governs what you get for your product. Yes. So you and hundreds, if not thousands, of other dairy uh, milkers have this same exact problem. You have a 24 hour window in which you got to move product from the farm to the processing plant. And if they can't handle it, at the processing plant, it stays, lose, it stays at the dairy if they can't take it. it stays. So you lose the revenue that would come from the milk yes, or definitely. the cheese or the butter or right. what have you. you. We get paid for the raw product and we would lose that money from that raw product. How quickly back up the employment or the uh, economic chain does that reach the people who work for you? Well, uh, it's, it hasn't gotten to that point, but if it did, everybody would be out of work because if it came to the point where we couldn't get paid for our product, we'd have to close it down. Okay. And it doesn't take long at, uh, at a tanker load of milk a day. Mr. Yates, in the uh, food processing business, one of the uh, standards you have to meet has to, or deals with food quality, the ability to ensure that the processing system is clean or clear of disease or infections and what have you. Is that correct? Absolutely, right. yes. So the FDA works with you, the California uh, Department of Food and Agriculture works with you just to make sure that the product coming out of the plants that your members run is fit for human consumption. It is safe and wholesome, yes. Okay. To the extent that you have an interruption in a black, let's say Campbell's food plant down here in South Sacramento, let's say they lose power. They have a cogen, but so they're probably not going to go down, but let's say they lose power. To the extent that they've lost power, just give me some sense of the 
impact on jobs at the plant and the farm gate that feeds the plant? Let's take, for example, a tomato, a back to a tomato processing facility. Uh, delivery of tomatoes to a food, to a tomato processing facility is a tightly orchestrated and scheduled endeavor. Mm -hmm. Typically, a load of tomatoes is at the plant no longer than three hours. In other words, from harvest to being stabilized is on average about three hours. Now, if that plant is down for 24 to 36 hours, first they have vessels filled with 20 to 40,000 pounds of tomato product. As soon as power is lost, the aseptic or the sterility of that system is lost. That food, thousands of pounds of it, have to be emptied out when the power comes back on because they have no power to get it out. Then that entire system has to be sterilized again and then they have to start the plant up in a sterile condition. In the meantime, during that 24 to 36 hours, there are crops in the field that are not going to get harvested because of the tight schedule of harvest and delivery. It's going to, as you, your su question suggests, it's going to back up, clear out to the field. More importantly, and I'll go to the natural gas situation, Let's say a plant is shut down for a week. Tomato processing is highly seasonal. There's approximately a million tons a week that would not get processed. That's nominally $50 million that growers would not be paid. The energy it took to grow that crop, water pumping and so forth, would be lost. There would be a week worth of wages lost by food processing employees. Remember, this is an enterprise that's relatively short, three months. So many of those workers depend upon working every day during the season. That's a week worth of wages lost. That's significant to those folks. On top of it, the California food processor would not have product to satisfy its customers' needs. And that product will likely be furnished by Chile, Italy, Greece, or some other of our global competitors because we do work in a global marketplace. Mr. Chairman, if you'll yield for a Certainly. question. Uh, Mr. Yates, I uh, learned about two weeks ago that the last sugar beet processor had uh, been closed. Is that true? And uh, how uh, difficult is that? And, and was there any effect of electricity in it? Uh, that's my understanding that the last one is gone. Uh, I don't believe that electricity was the cause of that. Sugar beet processing, it's a refining process. It is very energy intensive, natural gas dependent. There were another, a number of other factors uh, that have come to bear on the sugar beet industry in California, and if you want an elaboration, I'd be happy to pri provide it to you. We right. are, if they were in business, the Public Utilities Commission has proposed on-peak rates for electricity to raise by 545 percent, an increase of 30 cents a kilowatt hour. We simply can't operate on that basis. We can't shut down during those peak times. And it presents an extreme challenge of how we're going to cope with that kind of a outcome. I, want to follow. I, might, I might add on the sugar, if you could provide something for the record. I grew up on a farm 17 miles from Spreckel's uh, processing plant in Salinas. So uh, I will certainly uh, do that. Uh, the sugar beet industry in California, as you know, in years past was very vigorous, provided a lot of jobs, and it's very unfortunate that uh, uh, they're no longer in, in business in California. Mr. Yates, some of the suggestions during that we've heard have to do with shifting uh, load from, say, mid-afternoon overnight. My understanding during harvest season is that you 
that your members are running their plants 24 hours a day. Is that accurate? That is correct. So we, shifting load is pointless. Uh, shifting load is a very challenging prospect. Uh, remember, and I'm trying not to repeat, we're processing a huge volume of food that's harvested and ripe for a very short period of time. So in order to get it all stabilized, they're running 24 hours a day. Okay. Of course, there are periods of shutdown for cleanup. I mean, it's just like your kitchen. You got to stop once in a while and clean it up. Uh, we have advanced and are advancing a proposal to shrink that peak period of time for perishable food processors. Go ahead and double the price for that time, but at least give us a better opportunity to avoid that high price period. And we think there's a lot, number of food processors that might be able to work out a deal with their labor force, with their growers, with their truckers, and everyone else that's dealing with getting all this food and processed. Uh, at least we'd certainly like to have that opportunity. Uh, I need to ask one other question. I want to go to Mr. Euler on this. State of California has been put on watch by Moody's. Uh, as a result of the implications of the energy crisis we face. In a very real sense, that it's my understanding in the financial markets that will cause an increase in the bonding cost to the state of California. In other words, there'll be a premium attached to bonds from the state of California to reflect that added risk. Am I understanding that correctly, and what are the implications for provision of government services? You are understanding that correctly, and, and uh, that will increase the cost of all the bonded indebtedness for the state. And apparently, uh, there is some question as to whether the markets can receive and absorb the level of revenue bonds, because those are what are proposed to meet this electricity problem, uh, and, uh, and do so effectively. And so it is really riling up the uh, bond situation for the state of California and for our taxpayers. My time has expired. I want to go back to Chairman Burton for a follow-up. Yeah, yeah, let, let me, uh, I, ha I have a number of questions that I'd like for you to answer uh, as concisely as you can uh, because I want to have them for the record. Uh, the governor uh, is not releasing the figures that the state's paying for electricity. Is that information that uh, taxpayers uh, want to have and should have? Correct, and in our testimony, we have uh, written testimony, we have asked for that. Uh, uh, numbers of individuals and members of the media have asked, and that has not been forthcoming. It, has the governor given a reason why that has not been publicized? Uh, the, uh, the stated public reason is that this will interfere with um, uh, confidential negotiations for future power purchase contracts. Um, but uh, it seems to us that since he is obligating taxpayers, the taxpayers have a right to know to what degree and in what direction. Thank you. Uh, let me run through these questions uh, ra ra rapidly here and if you could answer them. In, in your uh, testimony, Mr. Yates, uh, you talk about the problems that processors will face in the event of a blackout. Uh, what actions is the food processing industry taking to try and cope with the predicted blackouts? Uh, you talked about scheduling a little bit and how difficulty, but uh, what alternative uh, fuels are you looking at, if any? And uh, uh, so if you could answer that. I'd well, thank you. We're doing a couple of things. We're working with our legislators uh, and the administration to pave the way for food processors and others to utilize uh, backup generation during a blackout period that has been achieved. What, what alternative fuels are you going to be using? Uh, pro <coughs> propane uh, for firing boilers. Uh -huh. the, the other thing we're, we're doing, and the industry, since this has not been a problem in the past, does not have, there's only about 5 to 7 percent of the industry that has backup generation. And this is backup generation that does not satisfy the entire electric requirements of the facility. It's minimal, it's enough to keep computers going, the control room going, and those sorts of things. So the lights on for employee safety and those, those sorts of things. And the industry is uh, 
a number of food processors are looking at acquiring backup generation. Very few are looking at enough backup generation to run the entire facility. That's just too much. Uh, and the only alternative fuel you mentioned there was uh, uh, liquefied gas? Uh, that's one of the options. Uh, diesel is another one, and I hasten to add that's an EPA that both of those have limits. They have emission limits. We're not asking that those be eased, but we're asking eventually let us comply with the offset requirements. Give us some more time to do that because it's practically impossible to do it in a time necessary for this summer processing season. In terms of using alternatives such as diesel oil or propane, uh, the regulatory barriers that you're facing, uh, uh, as you just mentioned, are difficult, but you don't want them relaxed. You just want them to be offset. In our case, yes. Do they, uh, in with, other areas, do they need to be relaxed? I mean, I know that in food processing, uh, in the other areas, uh, do you need to have a relaxation for a short period of time? Either one of you? Well, you know, I've stated to Congressman I, earlier I know you that stated, but do, do you have any facts that uh, shows that, uh, that, there should be, that, that there should be a relaxation of those EPA rules? Well, only by empirical evidence of the shutdown of perfectly capable generators who have run out of hours. And uh, th this is all arbitrary and artificial. Uh, and uh, to have people uh, uh, sit in the dark in their homes or in their factories in July because a local air quality management control district has arbitrarily shut down a generator is, in my judgment, absurd. Uh, I think I want go ahead. Could I just yes, ask one that fits on your question? As I drove into Sacramento this morning, I wondered uh, I've seen the sign over it. There's a fuel cell technology uh, movement going. And to what degree could that be helpful? Or is it doesn't do enough? Uh, you know, again, I have done uh, uh, only the normal reading on that, and there seems to be tremendous advances in fuel cells, and once that technology is refined, uh, a person can have that running their home or their business or whatever, but uh, that's not going to solve, uh, obviously, this summer's problem, and maybe not next. Mr. Chairman, if we could get a presentation from the fuel cell technology people as to where they are on this and what they can do. Uh, since the state has begun purchasing electricity, uh, your testimony, uh, Mr. Euler, uh, notes that Wall Street has reacted nev negatively. Uh, how would a downgraded bond rating affect the budget of California, and does it negatively affect other programs that rely on the state to issue bonds? Well, in driving up the uh, interest costs on the bond indebtedness, of course, that will harm the state. Uh, the commitment of I mean, we've had huge surpluses, which the state has spent over the last couple of years. The predicted surplus for the next year is probably ephemeral. Uh, we're probably eating into the money for uh, actual programs at this point. But because of the secrecy and the lid imposed by the governor's office, we don't know the specific details. Okay, let me just ask a couple Mr. more questions. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Yates has something. Uh, Mr. Yates. Mr. Burton, may I clarify further your pre earlier question about alternative fuels. My response was in relative to fuels to operate boilers. When it comes to the issue of utilizing diesel generators for electricity, there's, in my opinion, a number of arbitrary decisions that have been made. For example, there is 5,000 megawatts. My understanding, there's 5,000 megawatts of emergency backup generation sitting around the state and the state refuses to turn it loose but instead takes their chances on rolling blackouts why, why are they is it because of environmental concerns that they're refusing to turn that loose that's my understanding and, and five thousand megawatts you say that's my understanding yes mr chairman would you yield for a minute be happy to you uh, <laughs> mr yates five thousand megawatts a lot of megawatts uh, Hearing it anecdotally is one thing, seeing a list is another. Do you have a list? Uh, I believe we can obtain a list, I believe has been developed by the Air Resources Board. At least that is what has been represented to us by representatives from the California Air Resources Board. Uh, 
that there's 5,000 megawatts. We need now, modern, modern who, who would backup that? generation. Who would have that Mr. list? Mr. Yates just said the Air Resources Board here in the state of California is the source of that list, and source of that information. Yeah, are they keeping that secret, or are they not letting it, that out? It's not to, not to my knowledge, no. And I believe the governor's office has that kind of information. Well, how do we, well I know how we can get it. Well, you're the chairman. Yes. Well, well we, we could take a hard look at how to get we will, that. We will get that information. We'll if you could tell us the name of the person who gave you that anecdotal information, we will be able to follow up accordingly. Uh, I, I will certainly provide that to you. Thank you. And uh, one last comment. Relative to this scare, fear of diesel generation, a modern one megawatt portable generator puts out as much emissions, if you will, as three trucks rolling down the highway. So people are making a big boogeyman out of this, and they ought to be taking a harder look at it. Thank you. Let me just ask a couple more Certainly. questions so I can get these for our record, to Mr. Chairman. How much of a role do you believe uh, federal and state environmental regulations have in restricting the supply of electricity? I mean, how severe is, is the controls uh, affecting the supply? It's my observation, if I may, that all of the new power plants being proposed to be built in California are setting new records for cleanliness. Not only in terms of their emissions, but their efficiency. They are so much more efficient that the amount of emissions, not only are the emission limits very low, but the amount of emissions per, per megawatt are extremely low. And they, they're going to push out the old... Are, are they being plant. held up for any reason since they meet the criteria that they should? It's my understanding that the expedited processes at the California Energy Commission, who is responsible for citing those, is proceeding uh, at the high levels as expected. Okay. If I may add, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, one of the things that we've recommended and that the governor has in his emergency powers is to make the decision of the California Energy Commission with respect to the siting of any particular plant uh, final, uh, irrespective of local land use controls. And he ought to do that because we now have uh, problems at the local level, not in the NIMBY problem, not in my backyard, and yet we need to site those plants close to the user base given the antiquated nature of our transmission system and expedite that process before the California Energy Commission. Mr. Chairman, I have a, a few questions I'd like to submit for the record for Mr. Verboom on the dairy products, but if we could get those to him, just answer. Thank you. I do, I want to go back to, Mr. Chairman, just for your information, I want to go back to Mr. Yates. Current California Energy Commission requirements are that a generating facility in excess of 50 megawatts must come before the commission for review. I know that Assemblyman Cox has a propo legislative proposal that would raise that threshold from 50 to 125 megawatts as the threshold. The reason being is that the technology that's existing for these turbines typically creates a turbine of 60 megawatts capacity. So 50 megawatt threshold is kind of pointless because everything's got to go. If we could get that to move forward, we'd have a lot of these standby generators doubling their capacity uh, without having to go through a lengthy review process. We'll put that in the record. So. Mr. Horn, anything else? When you ask for that figure, I'd like to see it broken down in terms of hospitals, which already have generators, and uh, then try to get it in the rest of the economy, the agriculture. You're talking about the so 5,000 megawatts? Exactly. Figure. Okay. Yeah. All right. I want to thank these witnesses for uh, joining us today. <laughs> Your information has been solid, and I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and call up the next panel. That would be Mr. Kevin Madden, Mrs. Loretta Lynch, Mr. Terry Winter, Mr. Larry McAvick. Joining us on this panel, we'll just move from my left to the right. First witness 
is Mr. Kevin Madden, who is the General Counsel for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Mr. Madden, you are recognized for a five-minute statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the committee and subcommittee for the opportunity here to discuss the topic of electricity markets in California and surrounding states. As Mr. Chairman said, I'm Kevin P. Madden. I'm the General Counsel of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I appear today as a Commission staff witness, and I do not speak on behalf of the Commission. Electricity markets in California and throughout much of the West are in a state of stress, and they will continue to experience various serious problems throughout the coming summer. Wholesale prices have increased substantially. Consumers are being implored to conserve as much as possible, and utilities continue to face severe financial problems. PG&E has just filed for reorganization under Chapter 11 of the, reorgan of the bank U.S. Bankruptcy Code last week. The Commission has aggressively been identifying and implementing market-driven solutions to the problems. Let me just highlight some of the recent actions we have taken to address these problems. Earlier this month, the Commission took strong action to mitigate prices in California's electricity markets for the periods of January and February. The Commission identified many transactions during these two months that warranted further investigation. The Commission required these sellers to either refund certain amounts or to offset those amounts against what's already owed them. They also require them to provide any additional information in which they believe could justify their particular rates. The total amount of potential refunds for just those two months, January and February, amounted to $124 million. Also in March, the Commission issued an order seeking to increase energy supplies and reduce energy demand in California and in the West. The Commission implemented certain measures immediately. They include extending and broadening waivers for certain facilities under PURPA, enabling those facilities to generate more, more electricity without the restrictions that they usually have. Two, we expedited the certification of natural gas pipelines into California and the West. And just this week, the Commission authorized Kern River Pipeline to provide additional capacity into Southern California, approximately 300 MCF a day, and is expected to come online June or July of this summer. We also urged all licensees to review the FERC licenses that they hold in order to assess the potential to increase the generating capacity at those particular project, projects. The Commission also proposed and sought comment on what m other measures should it employ to incent rates for transmission facilities and natural gas facilities in order for them to be online and provide energy this summer. Finally, the Commission announced a one-day conference with state commissioners and other state representatives from western states to discuss the volatility of the price in the western United States, as well as other issues needed to address those particular prices, infrastructure, for example. The conference is being held today in Boise, Idaho. On March 14th, the Commission ordered two utilities to justify the duration of the outages this, uh, in 2000, April and May of 2000, at their California generating facilities. The outages forced the California ISO to purchase more expensive power from the utilities for the generating facilities. Absent adequate justification, the utilities must make refunds in the amount of $10.8 million. On March 28th, the Commission also addressed a complaint filed by the California Public Utility Commission under Section 5 of the Natural Gas Act against a pipeline company and its marketing affiliate. While FERC found one part of the complaint unsupported, FERC ordered a hearing on whether the pipeline and its affiliate had market power and if so, used that market power to drive up the prices of natural gas at the California border. 
The case is now pending before an administrative judge, and the commission set this on fast track with a decision back to the commission in 60 days. Finally, the commission staff, at the commission's direction, has proposed a market monitoring and mitigation plan for California. This would require all sellers, all sellers, with uncommitted power to sell in the real-time market. The Commission is currently considering comments on this proposal filed by numerous entities and expects to act on this in the near future for the summer. These actions, I believe, demonstrate the Commission's commitment to take all appropriate actions to remedy the current imbalances in Western energy markets. While some have accused the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission of being indifferent or even hostile to the concerns of California consumers, our actions prove otherwise, and it's not true. We have pursued the remedies we believe will be most effective, not only in the short term, but also in the long term. No one should doubt our commitment to ensure an adequate supply of energy for all consumers at reasonable prices. By its health, however, the Commission cannot contribute all it can only contribute a small part of the solution to today's energy problems. A more comprehensive and permanent solution requires the involvement of the states and other federal agencies and departments. In particular, California must do as much as possible to expedite the construction of newer power plants. I am encouraged by all the hard work and effort taken in recent months. Mr. Ben, are you about done? Your, about light, done. your time's about up here. So you need to wrap up. I'm encouraged by the action taken by the state of California and the other, other states, but we must be vigilant to ensure that these new facilities are, are built. Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is Ms. Loretta Lynch, who's the president of the California Public Utilities Commission. Ms. Lynch, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. California's restructuring experiment has erroneously been called deregulation. Rather, California federalized the regulation of its energy prices by allowing the utilities to sell off their generating plants to private merchant generators, converting retail relationships to unbundled wholesale relationships, which created a wholesale market for electricity that was then regulated by the federal government, not by California. To a much greater extent than was wise, California, under the Wilson administration, placed control of its essential economic infrastructure in the hands of the federal government and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Federalizing control of California's grid has limited California's ability to protect our economy from price gouging and supply withholding. To a much greater extent than was wise, California under the Wilson administration dismantled the integrated energy service delivery mechanisms in order to create business opportunities for speculators. The prior administration caused the utilities to sell off much of their generation to entities who now hold California hostage daily to extortionate price demands for electricity, a fundamental economic necessity that cannot be stored and for which there is no effective substitute. California, under the leadership of Governor Davis, is already pursuing structural reforms that will reduce our residents' and businesses' exposure to and dependence on the deregulated wholesale market. These include ending the practice of divesting utility-owned generation and selling it off to private marketeers, reacquiring control of the transmission system, and reforming the ISO and returning to a rational system of unit commitment and dispatching the grid. The California Public Utilities Commission took a very difficult action a few weeks ago when we raised retail rates by four cents a kilowatt hour since January. Mr. Burton, that would equal a 60% increase in your district in Indiana. It may not be enough if the current price gouging practices persist and remain unabated by federal regulators. I've prepared an exhibit that's attached to my testimony that illustrates what's happened in the California wholesale pricing market. From April 1998, when the California market opened, to January 2000, wholesale prices remained at traditional levels, 30 to $35 per megawatt hour. But beginning in January 2000, wholesale prices began to climb, averaging about 60% above the previous year. 
Beginning in May 2000, average prices climbed to over $100 a megawatt hour, reaching a peak of $166 per megawatt hour in August, 200 to 300 percent above historic levels. On November 1st, the federal regulators indicated an intention to abolish price caps in the California wholesale market, and prices began a further upward spiral. On December 8th, the FERC, in a secret order procured by Mr. Winter without notice to a single California state policymaker or elected official, eliminated all price caps, and average prices rose to $377 per megawatt hour for the month of December, a level 10 times the historic average. Wholesale prices for electricity in California have remained at about that level since, and they bear absolutely no correlation to demand, since these prices are occurring right now at the lowest load levels of the year. It is significant that peak demand has not increased significantly in the past four years. The same plants are running that have served load in California for the past 30 years, using the same fuels and with the same pollution emissions profiles. But the practice of physical and economic withholding continually puts California on the ragged edge. Any shortage of generation to meet demand has been due to the failure of the merchant generators to provide sufficient supply and the failure of past administrations to require that electricity supply be built. Prior to restructuring, California added over 15,000 megawatts of new generation from 1980 to the mid-1990s. In addition, thousands of megawatts were obtained from aggressive conservation programs and new interstate transmission lines. During the 1980s, California added power plants notwithstanding our appropriate environmental requirements that were then in place. However, all this development stopped in the mid-1990s when California, under the Wilson administration, unwisely decided to depend on the competitive, unregulated market. Under Governor Davis, California is now taking every action to expedite the development of new generation. We're restarting long-retired utility power plants. We're providing incentives for distributed generation and renewable energy pro projects. We're streamlining the permitting of large power plants that are much more efficient and cleaner running than current plants. We're obtaining waivers from federal regulators to allow qualifying facilities to increase generation capacity. And California is making a historic commitment of ratepayer and taxpayer monies to provide $1.5 billion in energy efficiency incentives to our businesses and families so that we can use electricity as wisely and as effectively as possible. California's energy efficiency commitment dwarfs comparable federal commitments. However, all these changes under Governor Davis may not be sufficient to stem our problems we're facing this summer, particularly in light of the supplier's ability to withhold generation capacity. You know, we're experiencing the application of a strategy that was clearly articulated years ago by the merchant generators, and I'd like to quote, we have a lot of experience dealing with summer peaks and dispa dispatching plants. This is a quote from Mr. Oglesby, who was president of Reliance Marketing Subsidiary. He says, quote, when you operate on a merchant basis and sell into a power exchange, you can watch the price climb during the day. We might decide to hold our plant off the market at 12 noon, even if the price looks favorable, because we can get a better price at 4 p.m. We think we know a little bit about what will happen if we hold our plant out a few hours. We can play on that expertise. And my testimony has the quote from Mr. Oglesby. What we realize is that the merchant generators will hold California over a barrel unless the federal regulators do their job. The Federal Power Act provides for cost-based rates. The act requires just and reasonable wholesale rates or else under the statutes that Congress passed, those rates are unlawful. Where market power exists, all sellers must have cost-based rates. One part of the answer to California's dilemma is to move back to cost-based rates as quickly as possible, given the market that even the FERC calls dysfunctional. The federal law requires it. If FERC is unwilling to enforce the laws on its own that are currently on the books, the Congress should direct the FERC to do so. I have additional testimony. I see my time is running short, so I would like to wrap it up, but I'd like to be open to questions, especially about long-term contracts, because the committee had asked specifically for testimony about that. But I would like to address one final issue, which is the cost of natural gas in California. Wholesale natural gas is twice as expensive in California as anywhere else. This is entirely a function of the cost and lack of availability of interstate transportation. Again, the practice of withholding and price gouging, the classic symptoms of unlawful market power of the kind the Natural Gas Act was intended to prevent, is victimizing California without a remedy from the FERC. 
The remedy here is for Congress to require the FERC to reverse its ill-considered two-year regulatory exemption of the natural gas secondary market and to re-regulate the secondary market for natural gas transport so that the infrastructure that consumers have built and paid for is fully utilized. Okay. Many fingers have been pointed over California's energy crisis, but the cause is simple and fundamental. The federal market cops decided to leave the beat, leaving the market completely unattended. The nation has seen this situation play out before, in the 1920s, when electricity and natural gas providers kept the whole nation over a barrel. That gaming and gouging led to the 1935 Federal Power Act that Congress passed, a statute that was designed to protect businesses and consumers from sellers who possessed market power. We face that situation again today, and Congress should require FERC to enforce the federal statutes already on the books. Ms. Lynch, we're going we're gonna to wrap up here. <coughs> sure. Yes. I've submitted testimony with testimony? several documents right. responding to the questions the committee had asked me to prepare. I, we, will we will submit your written statement for the record. Appreciate you giving it to us. Our next witness. Our next. Our next witness is Mr. Terry Winter, who's the president and CEO of the California Independent System Operator. Mr. Winter, I've been kind to Mr. Madden and Ms. Lynch, but I'm going to give you five minutes. <laughs> That's not unusual for me. All right. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of Congress. First off, I'd like to hey, explain can you a little bit. A little bit closer. Mic closer. <clears throat> First off, I would like to. Uh, is it working? There you yes. Go. If you'll angle it up. There you go. Okay. First off, I'd like to explain what the ISO does. We are the operator of the transmission system, and uh, we take schedules. We are not always privy to what the, all the prices are. Uh, many bilateral contracts go through us that we never see. So oftentimes people what the costs are. We have no way of doing that. Our job is to perform the uh, scheduling on the system and ensure that supply and we must uh, interrupt firm load we're the ones that make that order there are four things that I'd like to very briefly talk about and try to stay within my five minutes the first uh, second is today's operation what we go through third is the summer load that we're looking forward to and fourth market costs um, <coughs> My statement on bankruptcy is that one of the things that the operator needs desperately is some stability to what is going to happen during the day. And because of that, I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that these companies that have moved into bankruptcy continue their attention on the operation. And I believe PG&E's first uh, motion was to ensure that their employees would be paid but we also have many plans uh, for transmission lines that they are building at the current time, and we need to assure that they have the financial where to, to uh, serve the customers uh, and the rate bearers of California. Today's operation, I don't think I can begin to explain to you all without an hour or two or actually have you out there what it means to come in at 7 o'clock in the morning and sit down with the operators who are facing a five to 7,000 megawatt shortage that day as they move into their 7 o'clock time frame. That means at that point we have to go out into the uh, market and beyond the market to get all available generation. We face that every day, and this summer we had periods when we were actually 16,000 megawatts short. Looking forward to this summer, um, forecasting is always a dangerous business, but I will tell you that we have done a rather um, pessimistic report, which we are are the, some of the worst cases. But that shows in June that we will be about 3,700 megawatts short on peak. Now, uh, that decays as we move on into the summer because of new generation. There's approximately 2,500 megawatts of generation that will be coming online in July and August of this year. So it, it moves down to around the 600 megawatt uh, time frame or uh, level. But it should be noticed that while we have not factored in things like conservation and, and 
the impact that increased prices will have, uh, we also, on the other side, have not looked at the worst possible heat summer. We have not looked at the worst possible situation of import from out of state. To give you an idea, in 1999, we were importing 9,000 megawatts from other states. Uh, last year, we were importing between five and 6,000. Right now, I am extremely lucky if I can get 1,000 to 1,500 from out of state. And what that has resulted in is that we have to run in-state generation about 20 to 30 percent more than we ever have in the past. Moving on to markets. Uh, we were constantly asked uh, how much we felt the market uh, uh, was being paid above what would be a normal uh, competitive hourly rate in, in normal markets. Our figures show that, that there is about a, a little over six billion dollar uh, cost that we cannot explain either through scarcity, uh, cost of natural gas, cost of higher emissions, etc. We have filed those reports with FERC uh, and hopefully they will be able to uh, uh, review those and, and make their findings on those because we don't always have all the information. But just in broad figures, that's about a 35 percent increase over what we would expect in competitive markets, which allow for a, a portion of it to be paid above cost base just because of the lack of supply. With that, I will stop and hold to my five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Winter. The trap door will not open underneath you. <laughs> <laughs> Our final witness is Mr. Larry Makovich, who's the Senior Director of Cambridge Energy Research Associates. Mr. Makovich, for five minutes. Thank you. When California passed its restructuring laws five years ago, it set a goal to move from regulation and towards the market. California would still benefit to, from a move to a market that works. Unfortunately, the power market in California was set up with serious structural flaws right from the start. These flaws made it neither possible nor profitable to build power plants when needed. These flaws were a siting and permitting process that creates costly and time-consuming barriers to new power plant development, a power market that paid generators to utilize their power plants but did not pay them enough to have capacity in place to meet peak demand, and retail prices that were delinked from wholesale prices. And by disconnecting the demand side from the market, it put utilities in an unsustainable position that has resulted in bankruptcy and supply reduction. The flawed market design was the first problem, but an even greater problem has been the complacency demonstrated when the evidence that the market flaws were playing out and creating a shortage. In answer to Congressman Burton's question, was there evidence that this shortage was happening? The answer is clearly yes. The California and power generating capability declined. They failed to site and permit the 1,200 megawatts needed each year to keep supply and demand in balance. California ran out of capacity because it never set up a market to supply it. From 96 through 99, the California power market passed from supply surplus balance to a supply shortage, and the market clearing prices in California were clearly too low to support enough timely investment. California made a deliberate mistake to expect that the energy market alone, through either spot prices or energy contracts, would keep power on run. No other power market set up around the world relies solely on an energy market. California's energy market as set Prior to the shortage, the energy market was very competitive, paid generators to utilize their power plants efficiently, kept To do this, it had to clear on variable costs alone. The average annual wholesale price for power ranged from four or This is a level that's half of what's necessary to support new power supply development for capacity to provide an additional timely payment to attract investment. However, the majority of stakeholders who set up the rules in California 
decided not to pay for capacity as long as reliability is free. What needs to be done in California to solve the problem falls into two categories, short-run actions to deal with the crisis and long-run actions to fix the market. In the short run, California needs to connect wholesale and retail to power supply. The question is, are there signs that things aren't being done? If five fire generation is not being coordinated and plans being made to synchronize in that grid, there's clear evidence that the efforts needed to run are not being done. Testimony has also made it clear that there needs to be flexibility in environmental regulations that are currently limiting power supply. In the long run, California needs to fix its market. It needs to establish a capacity market by mandating a capacity requirement and enforcing a deficiency penalty. It needs to set and enforce target levels of siting and permitting for new power plants and meet those year after year. And it needs to create clear. California is doing only some of what needs to be done and many current policies are not working. Retail and wholesale power prices delinked have led to bankruptcies. It's kept thousands of megawatts out of supply. Using the state time and effort and resources further distort the market and is taking the efforts away from increasing supply. The Department of Water Resources moving to long-term contracts at the top of the market is a mistake. These contracts have allowed California to push the recovery of current costs into the future. California will regret signing these commitments in the years to come. In addition, barriers to new supply remain. Even with all the attention and hoopla focused on new supply, we're looking at about 1,300 megawatts from last summer to this summer of new supply, which is just about enough to offset one year's growth. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is also making mistakes in the way it is setting price caps. It is creating the perverse incentive not to run power plants at peak demand. California needs to realize it competes in a worldwide market to attract capital for power development. It's created a very negative and hostile environment to that in, uh, uh, in investment, and it's moving to a very expensive and expansive public power entity. Thank you, Mr. Makovich. I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Congressman <coughs> Horn to initiate the questions here for 10 minutes. Just a few uh, to clarify a few things. Uh, uh, President uh, Lynch, uh, as uh, chairman of the California Public Utilities Commission, I'm, I'm sure you did look at this whole situation over time. Uh, did you ever work for the California legislature at all? I did. You did. Was it at the time they were talking about deregulation? No. Uh, when did they first start on deregulation? Well, they passed the bill in August of 1996. I believe they were talking about right. It and as I remember, before. Steve Pace was the leader of that. I believe that uh, Senator Brulte is the author of the legislation. Really? Well, I guess everybody else saw it as uh, peace. Uh, who was a Democrat, and every single member, Democrat and Republican, voted for that, I believe, as I remember the vote. I wasn't there. Okay, you weren't there. Well, Mr. Chairman, let's get at uh, what the truth of it is in the record at this point as to did they all agree to it or didn't they? But as I remember, they all agreed to it on deregulation. If the gentleman would yield, yeah, it's my understanding that AB 1890, which is the legislation that implemented the restructuring was at least in part authored by a senator by then assemblyman Brulte and that senator peace carried it in the senate okay and so then those it was adopted unanimously and it was adopted. that is my understanding that's right we can okay. check that <clears throat> so that's one thing to clarify let me ask you about the uh, situation in uh, we have a letter here uh, from a, uh, a law firm that uh, uh, gave us some sort of, uh, this is uh, Swidler, Merlin, Sheriff Friedman in uh, Washington. Uh, is that a representation of the uh, public uh, utilities? Or I'm just curious. 
uh, we have a letter from them, and uh, I just wondered, or do they speak uh, for the California Utilities Commission? No, we have our own independent legal staff. In Washington? Uh, no, in California. I see, because we you're have... talking about the federal side, and I just wondered if you kept counsel uh, no, we have side. state employees mm -hmm. who are lawyers who represent the state of California Public Utilities Commission in Washington at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Well, whoever in this panel can uh, put this together, but let me tell you what worried us. Uh, when uh, $6.7 billion were presumably potential excess costs. Now, the fact is when you put all the figures out, you're talking about uh, 6.7 total overcharges for the independent uh, systems operator and the power itself, including ancillary services from May to 2000 until February 2001, that's eight months, and 4 billion of the 6.7 billion is from that, say a lot of people. And uh, I'd like to know what the Mr. Winter says on this. 3.1 billion is from the federal uh, commission and uh, jurisdictional sellers, and then 1.3 billion occurred between October 2000 and February 2001, and that was uh, several months. Mr. Winter, could you untangle this as to who did what to Cock Robin? What it boils <laughs> okay. down uh, to. So that it is clear, Swidler is the representative of the ISO in Washington, D.C., and does our filings uh, with them. The report you're referring to was our uh, comments to the FERC uh, market uh, uh, monitoring program. If you look at the numbers, the first thing we were asked to do was to look at uh, the total wholesale energy cost, excluding the utilities. And of that, we uh, found that there was about uh, 6.2 or 6.7, whichever number you referred to. Uh, that was a, what we would consider to be what you would expect if you had a working uh, market. In other words, if you had a, a market that was working and had hourly prices, you would expect a certain price. The price that, that Californians paid was $6.7 billion above that number. Now, that number is made up of several components, one of those being bilateral contracts that we do not have any knowledge of exactly what is included in those. So that's about two, of uh, that savings of the total savings, about two billion was extrapolated from what we saw the market, so which leaves us the four billion that is, is uh, over, you used the term overcharged, I would say above market prices. Of that, a portion was the PX, Part of it was the ISO real-time, and part of it was ancillary services. The PX Energy, we have a good feel for because as they were running, uh, they had uh, uh, rates that were open to us, and so we could review those. If you then break that $4 billion down, it, it, it amounts to approximately $3 billion that is in the jurisdictional jurisdiction of FERC and about one billion that is non-jurisdictional. Okay, now, if you go to the timing, because there was a lot of debate over when FERC could or could not do certain things, and if you looked at the time frame from May through September, and May is when we saw the cost start to go up, uh, May through September, FERC jurisdictional was about 1.7 uh, million. FERC jurisdictional for the months of October through February was 1.3 million. For a total FERC juris, uh, jurisdictional for that time frame of 3 million. So I, I, I can submit this, uh, this document. It's all in the report, and I assume that's what you're reading from those. Well, that's right. It seems to me with 1.3 billion occurred between October 2000 and February 2001, is, and you say that is accurate. Yes. Okay. Is there anything here that is not accurate? Because one thing is that the Federal Commission has a very small role compared to uh, the State Commission. 
Well, uh, the part I wouldn't, I wouldn't classify it as not accurate. The one we don't have information on are the bilateral contracts that are done outside of, of our uh, knowledge. Now, who would uh, know what uh, those contracts amounted to? Um, uh, the entities who entered into them, which were the uh, generators and the uh, utilities, and later on, of course, the uh, Department of Water Resources. Well, did they file a document anywhere? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I wouldn't be the expert on that. Well, ordinarily, uh, Ms. Lynch, uh, between the two of you, you ought to know whether it's federal, state, or what, or do they have to do anything? It just seems to me somewhere a regulatory commission ought to know what those amounts were. I do not. I would assume that FERC can get that information, but uh, we do well, not have Well, how about it, Mr. Madden? Well, uh, Congressman Horn, you asked a very interesting question. Um, the six point that, that usually when I, somebody says that, I give them a, a C as a student. So <laughs> as a former professor, is this going to be more than interesting? It's okay, going to be more that's than what answer. we want. Uh, the $6.2 billion figure that the ISO submitted, uh, I think, around March 22nd as a basis that people read as excess refunds due consumers um, is somewhat shaky. And we asked them last week to provide us the details. Now, what you have to understand is that the $6.2 billion covers a period from May of 2000 through February of 2001. Eight months. It also includes non-jurisdictional money. And those are sales made by munis or co-ops, such as SMUD or LADWR, or power marketing, federal power marketing administrators in, in the Northwest, or other entities that we do not have jurisdiction over. We find for the first time I hear that approximately two billion is associated with bilateral contracts, which is not even subject to our refund order. We were dealing with a, re, a real time market. So Congressman Horn, to get to the bottom line, the FERC asked them to provide us the detail necessary to explain why or how they arrived at the 6.2. And today, you know, for the first time I'm hearing you know, how they're trying to carve out the $6.2 billion. Uh, we can require the jurisdictional sellers, the jurisdictional sellers, the public utilities, to provide us that information. We have sent a data request to the ISO to provide us that information relative to both the jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional. So you have no problem with asking for those? I have no problem at all, sir. Okay. Uh, do you think the state uh, commission ought to do that also? Well, if these are wholesale costs, um, they, they will be submitted uh, to us. Of course, uh, the California Public Utility Commission can provide us response, and I believe it uh, has to some extent with respect to the ISO filing. Um, but they are welcome to provide the comments once the ISO provides us with the information we have requested. Uh, President Lynch, uh, are, is your commission going to ask for the ISO information? We do have the ISO information. I applaud Mr. Winter's uh, uh, cooperation now that we have new members of the board who are not stakeholders and not self-interested in the board. We had quite a bit of trouble as an entity of the state of California obtaining basic information from the ISO and the sellers in the fall, um, and we had applied to FERC for help in getting that information, but we did not receive that help. But now that we have disinterested members on the ISO, after the governor and the legislature changed state law, we have had much more cooperation. You noted, Congressman Horn, that uh, the FERC has a small role. Actually, I think the FERC has the whole ball game because they control wholesale prices. We can ask for the information and fight in court with the generators over receiving it, but we cannot impose price rationality in the system. That is entirely FERC's jurisdiction as the federal regulator. Is that correct, Mr. Matt? We, uh, we have 
total authority over the wholesale rates. That's correct. And we have requested that information from the ISO. And if we do not get the full details, we can request and will request the information from the individual generators to the extent they're jurisdictional. Well, Mr. would you yield for a minute? Well, let me just, let's yeah. just jump in here. Mr. Winter, can you give the information to Mr. Madden so we can cut this... <laughs> crap out. Yeah, I, I find this very interesting, but I won't comment on that. Yes, they have the information that we have. The interesting thing is that we have no authority to get from the generators what their actual costs were, so the, all we can do is present to FERC our suspicions. Now, FERC is the one that has the authority to go to the generator and say, justify your rates. Okay, uh, so we can get the information that you have to Mr. Madden. That's no problem. It's okay. already been submitted. Yeah, and then uh, I think President Lynch was going to note something here as you started a breath there, and uh, I assume that's a paragraph. So <laughs> what's, well, how do you feel about that? The important yeah. uh, conclusion is that the ISO, using all the information in its that was available to it, under the most conservative assumptions, found that the sellers overcharged Californians over $6 billion in less than a year. You know, in 1999, California paid $7.4 billion for power, for electricity. In 2000, we paid over $27 billion for electricity. That's $20 billion more in just one year for a 2% increase in demand. And to paraphrase David Freeman, even a blind pig can figure out that there's price gouging in that kind of market. But it does fall to FERC to demonstrate the, or to uh, identify the gouging. Uh, you mentioned stakeholders and that how uh, they've gone down to five from uh, what it had, you called it, interested parties. Uh, tell me about how that worked. Uh, did you make recommendations to the uh, governor and uh, uh, advise him that, look, uh, these people are just doing something for themselves. Mr. Mr. Yeah. Moore, yeah. Could, we, could we have a second round of questions? Okay. All right. I mean, we'll come back to that. Yeah. I'd like to recognize uh, Chairman Burton for 10 minutes. Uh, do you have uh, the information from the generators that uh, Mr. Winter alluded to? We. I don't know all the information that Mr. Winters alluded to. We have requested information from the generators from the January-February period in which we established a $124 million refund, and we asked them to provide us with the cost data or accept the refund numbers. As to the October-November period, uh, we have sent out a data request to the generators asking for cost data. Well, how long do you give them to get that information? Uh, in the uh, seven days. In one case, and I seven think days. Seven when, days. When did you send the request out? We sent the request out for October, November last week. Why did you not do that before that? Uh, the reason being, in the December fifteenth order that the commission set for, uh, you know, established in the two hundred six, required us first to look at the January to April period where we established the break point, uh, uh, one hundred fifty dollar review, for megawatts. So we focused on that first. We are now turning our efforts to the October-December period. It, 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 it seems to me, of course, I'm a novice at this, that you ought to kick it into high gear and get that stuff. Uh, Chairman, we are. Uh, we just had different rules apply in that I, period. I, yeah, uh, uh, we will talk to the head of the agency and find out why this isn't getting done quicker. I mean, there's a, there's a problem out here that needs to be solved, and I think there's enough blame to go around. Uh, Ms. Lynch... Um, you uh, said, I guess, or maybe it was Mr. Winter said, that there was uh, anticipated a shortfall peak in June of around 3,700 megawatts. That's correct. Is that right? And that it might go down to 600 megawatt shortfall around September? Correct. Have you taken into consideration the 5,000 megawatts that could be produced through diesel power that's supposedly sitting around someplace in this state? Yeah, I, uh, that number was a little bit of a surprise to me. I was. Uh, Why is it a surprise to you? Well, because I know that there is generation, but we do not look at emergency generation. Why? Well, for two reasons. Number one is the operator. Let's say you have a hospital that has a 50 megawatt, or let's say it's a 10 megawatt generator. Uh -huh. That generator only serves the operating room. And so, well, when excuse me, let me interrupt. It, it just seems to me that under the circumstances that you face here in California, you'd get on the stick 
and find out where all that emergency power is so it could be utilized as quickly as possible when an emergency arises and to start you know saying that you you don't you haven't done that or you haven't checked you don't know what hospital is doing it and all those other things now obviously the hospital is going to use it for their own purposes in the event of a blackout but according to the people we had on the previous panel there's 5,000 megawatts of diesel power out there someplace that could be utilized. And when I look at what you're looking at here next year or this summer, you're 3,700 megawatts short. And you don't even know if that 5,000 megawatts that's diesel powered is going to be figured into the equation. If that is out there, then you've got a problem that can be solved. If it isn't, then you, 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 know, you, you, you can do something else. But you, you can't tell us anything today. Well, what I can tell you is that even if you could could identify 5,000, it is my belief that the majority of it would never be turned on because what the, the entity who has that generation would have to do is shut off half their business while they turned on just the emergency operating room. But how, how do you know that? Well, because I've been in the business for 40 years. But and have I know you looked into it? I mean, have you really done an analysis of it? Well, no, we have not well, done an analysis. I, don't you think you should? Uh, I believe that the Energy Commission is looking at those numbers, as is the governor's people, and when they identify how many megawatts are there, and we can identify how many could actually solve the problem as opposed to uh, not solving it, then we certainly would figure that into our equation. You know, I, I don't know how everybody else feels, but I, I feel like everybody's pointing the finger at somebody else. <laughs> And everybody's not doing the things that ought to be done to make sure that they have a complete analysis of where energy is, where alternative sources are, so they can get the job done, if possible, with, with what's out there. And you really don't know where the 5,000 megawatts they alluded to in the previous panel are. You, you, you say that it's probably in hospitals and every place else, but you really don't know. Uh, that's correct. I have not but, looked but, at it. But you will try to find out. Certainly. Do you know how long that'll take? Well, I think the information resides in the Energy Commission. and Can so you talk to them tomorrow or something? And find I can out? talk to them tomorrow. That'd be I'm great. That'd be great. Now, let me just ask you a question, Mrs. Lynch. Last summer, according to the records here, in uh, April, it was $26.56 per megawatt, Right. I don't know what you're referring to. But this, my, is my chart. this is the chart you gave us. Right. That's the average chart from the PX. Okay. So that's what it was per megawatt in May. In average. Okay. And then in May, in, 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 that was in April. And then in May, it jumped to $47.22. Right? Uh, on average, that's correct. On average. Well, about that time, uh, you had an offer to buy uh, electricity at $0.05 cents per kilowatt hour. And you didn't buy it. Why? Well, the Public Utilities Commission doesn't buy power. The utilities do. What the Public Com Utilities Commission does do is authorize the utilities to buy power. Did you power. authorize it? Absolutely. Since I've been on the Public Utilities Commission, the utilities have asked 10 times for authority for bilateral or forward contracts or the authority to participate in hedging price products. Why, Every why, single time, the Public Utilities Commission it, has allowed the utilities why, to do so. Why, why, why didn't they buy the electricity or sign the long-term long contract for five cents per kilowatt hour? I don't know their offer you're referring to. You don't know? I know that many offers were yeah. made at various points in time. I don't know a specific offer made in May of 2000. I know, but, but, but looking at the, at the jump, it went, there was a quantum leap from April through, uh, it was almost doubled in May, and then it was more than doubled again in June. And then it continued up from there. What, what, what was the situation? Just give me one second. No, who didn't? Because they had so much in. We're, we're going to talk, I guess, tomorrow uh, to in, in San Jose to some of the utilities, but the reason they didn't file for that was because they had so, according to our staff, was because there was so much interference from the staff at the, at the commission. All I that's know not, is every single true. time they asked for authority, we gave it to them, and in fact, the did, facts show... Did you give that, it to them in writing? 
Oh, absolutely. On Can I get decisions. copies of that? Certainly. August 3rd, we said you buy your full net short, your choice, your business decision. And the utilities, in fact, did purchase bilateral contracts. We moved with lightning speed. They asked us on July 21st for authority, and we turned it around in two weeks and gave them full authority two weeks later. Then they started to buy, and they bought in August, in September, in October, in November. So I believe it's a canard to say that we stood in their way because the facts show differently. They were buying at what rate? They were buying at whatever rate they chose. I, I guess I'm missing something here. Mm -hmm. Do that. No, that's, I believe, Mr. Chairman, what you said. I don't know the specific offer you're referring to because the utilities receive dozens, if not hundreds, of offers in a month. So I need to address that question to the utility themselves. I believe so. What the Public Utilities Commission did was give the utilities the authority to expand their business choices. They expanded their business choices to the full limit, and the utilities actually took advantage of some of that authority. Well, there's a, there's a difference of opinion, and we'll get their side of the story tomorrow because I, sure. for my staff here, they have said that the problem was that they couldn't get through the red tape or get through the staff at, at your office, but we'll, we'll check into that tomorrow. I have more questions, uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that for the record, and I will, I'd like to ask some of those uh, uh, on the next round. We will Sorry, come back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Winter, I want to uh, examine something here that troubles me greatly. Uh, Ms. Lynch, in her written testimony, talks about a December 8th order that you obtained from FERC eliminating price caps uh, December 8th of, let's see, 2000, and describes it as a secret order. Is that an accurate description? I think that's a little over dramatic. But How would you describe it? Uh, the way I would describe it is on Wednesday of that week, um, the prices, uh, we have a situation where we had a price cap of $250. And what was occurring was that we quickly reached the $250 and people were uh, then not selling us power until they would call us on the phone and say, I'm willing to give you the power, but the price is 300 we, when we make and go above price cap, what we are making is a bilateral agreement between the market and the, the ISO committed to that 300 price. We were completely inundated because the price of natural gas at that time was rising to the $40, $50 at, at burner tip, and we could not get power into the system. So on Friday, what I did was I, so that we could put these prices that we were having to pay under review of FERC. I did not remove the price cap. What I said was any money that we paid above the 150 price cap would now be subject to FERC review because I was already in the position that I was having to pay those to keep the lights on. So that's what we did in the, on the December 8th time frame. We immediately filed that at FERC. Uh, and they turned that decision around uh, that day and gave us authorization to, to make that uh, uh, or make that part of our market. Were there parties who were not or who were excluded from that process? I mean, I'm, I'm trying uh, no, to reconcile your statement with Ms. Ms. Yeah, Ms. I think Lynch's we moved extremely fast. There's no doubt about that uh, because I was in a situation where I literally could not make the phone calls that I had to in the operating room and I would not have had the power. Therefore, I made the emergency filing with FERC and enacted it the next day. Mr. Madden, your recollection is consistent with that? My recollection is almost consistent with that. They made an emergency filing on that day saying that they needed power and they, don't, they could not get the power at the $250 hard cap. They asked for a soft cap which to bid in the prices. Uh, we have authority under Section 205 of the Federal Power Act to waive the notice provisions in situations like this, and the Commission acted very swiftly on the filing, very swiftly, and issued the order so that the ISO could get power that day and the next day. Ms. Lynch, is it the word secret that's causing a problem here? I mean, I don't understand. 
Your testimony says that this, this was a secret order, and I'm trying. I'm this trying to find out how we get some collegiality, if you will, or call it whatever you want, in this process. Uh, we found out about it after it happened, and as an as the head of an administrative agency, one process that I take extremely seriously is the requirement for public notice and comment. I think that's a fundamental tenet of due process that's required by the United States Constitution. And what happened there was a private entity, the ISO, actually the head of a private entity without consulting or getting a vote of the board in a public process, went to FERC and privately asked for an emergency order. And FERC, without notice to a single California policymaker, or elected official granted that without the opportunity for anyone else in California to even comment, much less object. How do you reconcile that situation with the governor's refusal to disclose information on power contracts? The difference is the FERC is required to act under the Administrative Procedure Act according to its process. The governor is essential, or the Department of Water Resources is essentially in a market where arbitragers have the technological cap capacity and the expertise to take advantage of small bits of information in order to disadvantage California ratepayers. So if you're in a business transaction where you're bidding against a bunch of other bidders, you want to make sure that the other bidders don't know the terms of your bid because then they can outbid you. Essentially, Department of Water Resources is now in the business of buying electricity. And in that business situation, you don't want to hand over all the cards you possess to your business competitors. The difference here with FERC was that they were acting in their administrative capacity as a regulator, yet they failed to follow even the basic tenets of due process or notice. Seems to me that when the... Uh I just, I just have to say I don't I don't I can't quite understand the difference on, from a public policy standpoint, if you will, from ISO's action as you described in a secret manner that redounds to the adverse impact of California consumers and the inability of California taxpayers from a public policy standpoint getting information from the governor's office about these contracts for forward delivery of power that uses taxpayer resources. I don't, I'm trying to, afraid, I'm afraid I'm just a businessman. I'm not an attorney. I, do, I don't quite understand the difference. Well, certainly FERC failed to follow its federal statutes and administrative mandates such that its action should be entitled to deference. Because if you fail to follow the process and don't allow any other comment, then your action should not be entitled to deference. But as a business person, I'm sure you know the cutthroat world of business when you're competing on a price point or on a term of a contract. Notwithstanding that, DWR does not have a statute in which it failed to follow in competing in the business world to get the best price for California consumers. However, DWR has said that when that information is no longer business sensitive, it will uh, provide that information to the public. The problem here is why should we put all of our cards on the table and allow the same sellers who have continued to gouge the California utilities to gouge the state? Mr. Madden, do you share the I do not share differentiation that Mrs. Lynch is describing? I don't here? share that differentiation whatsoever, and I would like to correct the record. The Federal Power Act, Section 205, gives us full authority, full authority to act on a filing such as the ISO made that day without notice and for opportunity to comment. We filed the statute. It was an emergency type of situation. The ISO needed additional power. I want to. I want to move on to another. Can I uh, before? Certainly, the, Mr. Torrance. I'd like to follow this up a little, and get uh, the public administration aspects of it. Uh, Mr. Madden, or rather, Mr. Uh, Winter, uh, who appointed you to the position of independent system operator? Um, that was under AB 1890. The it's a not-for-profit uh, not corporation formed under the uh, authority of AB 1890 and under the corporate laws of uh, California. And who appointed you? The board at that time. Which board? Uh, 
We had a uh, stakeholder board. The original stakeholder board? That's correct. And there were, what, 28 people on it? 27, 28. 27, 28. And the law then, which is a state law, uh, had certain categories, I assume, consumer, uh, yes, it firm. Was, yeah, it was an attempt to be in a balance between consumers, suppliers, utilities, uh, uh, municipalities, uh, generators, all of those were on the board. Did the governor at that time uh, make all of those appointments, or did the board meet and make appointments uh, up to 28 or so? Uh, the way the process uh, worked was uh, the uh, state appointed a uh, oversight board, and it was their responsibility to take the candidates and approve those and then those uh, were sent on to FERC for approval. So in this case, it was Governor Davis, was it? That uh, put no, I on? believe that was done in uh, the 97 time frame, the first, uh, first board. Well, is that Governor Wilson or? I why? believe it was during that time okay. frame. Okay, somebody has to appoint them if they aren't voting each other that's in. That's correct. Okay, so that's the way it worked. Right. The legislature passed a law, the sitting governor of complied with the law and put in certain people. Now, the next governor uh, was worried, in the words of Mr. Lynch, with the uh, interested parties, maybe were too interested. So they left five stakeholders there, and as I remember, he left, took no. the consumer person and left them there. Yeah, ac actually, they, they, uh, uh, the existing stakeholder board all retired, and the new board was appointed. Only one member of that new board uh, was a past member and that of the was old board. Presumably, the consumer. That was a consumer representative. Yeah, the other four had no previous experience with electricity issues. Is what has been said. Is well, that true? Um, I don't know whether they have experience with electric issues or not. Uh, certainly, they didn't come from the energy side of the of the uh, business. Well, some think that that move was that uh, when the governor t took everybody away, uh, except the consumer representative, uh, that he brought on people in the middle of a crisis without any expertise to deal with it. Do you agree with that or what? Um, no, I think board's uh, uh, position is to rely on their staff to get up to date, and this board clearly has uh, spent the time and the effort to get uh, concurrent on energy issues. So those staff members, how many staff members were there? Uh, I'm not following well, staff Well, how many staff members came with the stakeholders board with the legislation authorizing that board? And uh, was that also uh, the board members, or was it the governor? Because obviously another governor had felt that they served at his pleasure, which is often the way federal boards are in Washington. So I'm curious, who picked the staff? Well, when you say staff, the staff of the ISO? Uh, that's right, the well, stakeholders the, uh, group and uh, the ISO stakeholder board. Well, the stakeholder board uh, picked the uh, officers who then, of course, selected the, the staff down through the organization. When the uh, new board came in, uh, it's their responsibility, of course. Uh, they had the choice of removing me if that's what they wanted to do. And clearly they could uh, uh, change any of the staff people that they so desired. Let me ask uh, you, Ms. Lynch, uh, did you help uh, staff the board because you're very close to the governor, obviously. So who put the board sure. together and who put the staff together? I run the Public Utilities Commission, which is a state entity. The independent system operator is a private, not-for-profit corporation, which is not a state entity. However, the governor under AB 5X, which was passed in January, does appoint a financially non-interested uh, five-member board. So the difference there was that these that anyone who could have a financial interest or was employed by someone who could have a financial interest in the decisions made by the ISO could not then serve on the ISO board. So the governor appointed five independent members of the ISO board pursuant to AB 5X. One of them was Michael Kahn, who was the 
past chairman of the Electricity Oversight Board of the State of California, and I would take issue with Mr. Winter that Mr. Kahn has considerable energy expertise forged in the heat of the recent crisis and certainly is one of the premier experts on this issue and on the failures of the restructuring experiment in California. In addition, Mr. Guardino, who is the executive director of the Silicon Valley Manufacturers Group, I believe has made it a special expertise of his to understand just exactly how this energy crisis is affecting the Silicon Valley and the key and critical component of California's business. So I think that Mr. Guardino also has considerable expertise, and I would take issue with Mr. Winter's statement. But uh, I'm curious, who's the chairman of that board now? Mr. Kahn, who was the past chairman of the okay. Electricity Oversight Board. Are we uh, going to have Mr. Kahn somewhere along between San Diego, Silicon Valley, and Sacramento? He was invited but declined to appear. Well, so much for open things. I believe that Mr. Winter is, is appearing on behalf of the entity that Mr. Kahn is the chair of. I want to... Would you yield? Yes. Mr. Madden, in terms of the... replacement or the retirement and the appointment of the new board for ISO. Now, I heard that, that has, those appointments come to FERC. Did FERC have concerns about this in the midst of, well, I mean, just based on this PX clearing price schedule, did the FERC have concerns about what was transpiring? The commissioner's December 15th order um, set a, a date, I can't correct, I, I don't recall the date, where the current board that existed prior prior to this new board uh, would have to be uh, reconstituted. And we set up a procedure whereby uh, we would have to have discussions, negotiations with the state as to the board composition. Um, as I, I believe those discussions never took place and that the um, I believe the governor appointed the uh, five board members. I can't get into the further details because there are pending matters before the commission regarding this subject. Okay. I see my time has long since expired. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Indiana for 10 minutes. Let me go through some of the questions that we've prepared for the record. And uh, if I'm redundant, I apologize, but we need to get these in the record so we can, when we get back to Washington, can go through this very thoroughly. Uh, Mr. Winter, on, uh, you said on a, an average summer day, the level of demand uh, varies, but it gets up to, you anticipate, around 3,700 megawatts short. Now, what's, what's the total megawatts on a summer day? On a summer day uh, with uh, normal summer, we get up around 47 to 48,000, and you add reserves, our demand is around 50,000 megawatts. Around 50,000 megawatts, and that's the peak? That's the peak. And then it goes down, I guess, after June? Uh, no, no. What happens is after, when we get to July, there's new generators coming on. So therefore, the peak day stays pretty much at the 47, 48,000 okay. level. And as we add mo more, more generation, then we, of course, our deficiency decreases. Okay. Uh, what Now, this summer... What do you anticipate the supply level to be? You said you would probably be 3,700 megawatts short, but what will the level be this summer? You said it's going to be the demand would be around 50,000. Correct. What's 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 the supply going to be? Do you have any projections on that? Well, the supply is made up of a, a lot of components. Uh, first is in-state generation, then there's out-of-state generation that we can get. Uh, I just want a number. <laughs> well. And I'm, I guess I, I'm a little struggling on uh, what do you mean by a number? Uh, well, if you're going to need 50,000 megawatts, do you have any idea on how much you're going to have? Yes, 3,000 less than that. So 47,000. 47, That's yeah. very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that the heat of the hearing room or the air conditioner? <laughs> it's the cookie smell. If a... Uh, if a few key plants have breakdowns this summer because they're old and have been running at full capacity, 
Uh, what will that? Do you have any projections on that? Uh, yes, we we have projected about 2,500 megawatts that would be off for emergency uh, reasons, breakage, etc. Uh, if that suddenly was much higher, then the number would go up, and we would be looking other places to try and obtain the power. You don't have any idea what the odds are that that would happen. Well, last year we saw uh, numbers ranging from around 1,800 up to around uh, 2,800 uh, during the summer. So you think the 2,500 is a fairly fairly we, good projection? We think that's a fairly good number. How frequently do you think California is going to have blackouts this summer? Do you have any rough idea on that? No, I, I keep hearing all these numbers that supposedly we came up with, but we in fact did not come up with them. Uh, the, uh, well, do you no, have any idea? No, the we can. No, we don't. So you're just kind of driving in the dark. Uh, that's the way we've been driving for quite a while each day. <laughs> Mr. Makovich, do you agree with that? Well, uh, two months ago, in a study that we released on the California crisis, uh, we did some fairly extensive computer simulation of this marketplace. Given uh, the, the expected conditions for this summer, normal weather, a soft economy, 1.5% growth in real GDP, an 8% outage rate on thermal plants, 80% of normal hydro. We're expecting 200 hours when there's no margin at all and 20 hours of rolling blackouts because the shortage is greater than 4,000 megawatts. Now, over what period of time would the 20 hours of rolling blackouts be? That will be concentrated around the peak demand period, which is going to be that August-September uh, time frame. So you're, you're talking about in a 24-hour day, there will be 20 hours of rolling blackouts? Is that what you're talking about? Across that time frame, it will be necessary to institute a rolling blackout, probably in Southern California, uh, because of the load patterns, uh, for a cumulative outage across the summer of 20 hours. You know, if I was a farmer, milk producer like the gentleman who was here a while ago, I'd, I'd want to have some kind of a, 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 of a heads up on when that rolling blackout is going to take place. Is there, any, is there any prospects of that to let them know when there's going to be a blackout? Or I was having dinner with some people the other night. I just happened to be having dinner with them, and right in the middle of dinner, everything went black. And, you know, we, and, and there was no warning whatsoever, and the whole area was black. Uh, so I just wondered, is there going to be any... Was that in California or Indiana? No, it was California. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was in, 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 in near Carmel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me quickly uh, tell you the process that we go through, and then I think that will answer the question. Number one, if it's a distribution system uh, problem that a transformer in your front yard blows up, then yes, that's happened and you're sure. out of power. Um, as the transmission operator, as we move into the morning, we make all of our projections and we go through a three-stage process. We start off with a stage one, and that usually indicates that we do not have enough resources to cover our full reserves. As we eat into our reserves, we get to a stage two, which is less than 5% reserves. And then a stage three, when we announce a stage three, that means that we, in fact, are uh, moving into an area where we expect to drop load. There is notifications that go to each of the utilities. The utilities, in turn, notify uh, their customers. And I believe, uh, and Loretta can correct me if I'm wrong here, I think they also uh, just recently passed that the utility had to give each of the blocks which is a certain amount of load that's going to be dropped, a notification if they're next on the line. Uh, the how, utility how far, in, how far in advance would that notification be given? Well, uh, we, we are in an hourly market, so things can happen within the hour. We warn people early in the morning through the stages and through the notification I, yeah, of the PECs. I, I understand this ex explanation you're giving, but how much time will people be given before there's a blackout? If the blackout is because we've identified there is, and I'm not trying to be evasive here, I'm just trying to help you understand what we face every day. And that is that uh, if we know, we send the warnings out. But literally in the hour that it can occur, we will not know until about 30 minutes before that hour begins. Then if we are faced with the loss of a large unit like we were the other day, 
then that drops to, you know, 15, 20 minutes is all the notice we can give because we just lost units that, and didn't have sufficient supply to You're meet the demand. talking about a transformer or something like that. Or a generator. Or I mean, we have a large generator that goes I was talking about in. in the normal course of things, the rolling blackouts because of shortages in the normal course of things, not the emergencies now. How much time will these people be given? Do you have any idea? The, the problem is we're operating on such a, a thin margin here that we we can predict immediately or uh, in the morning that we're going to have plenty of supply. But then we lose a unit. You're calling that emergency. I call that an everyday operation. Okay. You know? I guess I can't get the answer to that one. <laughs> Chairman Burton, if yes. I may, um, the Public Utilities Commission did just change the standards because you're absolutely right. People deserve to know. And even a half an hour's advance notice means you can turn off your computer, you can shut down your business process, you can make plans to run your, your backup generator. So what the Public Utilities Commission said to the utilities is you must notify in two ways. First, if you know that we're tight in the morning, then tell folks you're next up to bat so that people can know during the day that there's a chance that their block is going down. And then second, when you know that block's going down, tell them in advance. The utilities get a half an hour's notice, and often the ISO has more hour, more notice. I so see. folks deserve at least a half an I hour. I understand, but it just seems if, if there's a, even a remote possibility that there was going to be a blackout, you'd give them the heads up. And if it didn't occur, so, so much the better. Right. Uh, it's my time. Okay. Mr. Madden, in uh, December, FERC issued an order imposing what's come to be known as a soft price cap. If a generator charges more than $150 per megawatt hour, they have to file certain forms with FERC. Uh, did you ex have you explained that yet, how that works? I did not get into the breakpoint analysis, no. No, Mr. Chairman. Well, you want to real quickly explain that so that we'd have that on the record? Um, prior to, uh, in the December 15th order, the commission established going forward January 1, that there would be a breakpoint analysis in which <laughs> Sellers who bid in below 150 would get the market clearing price. So even if you bid in 100, you would get 150. For those bids above 150, the commission required that the sellers provide transactional data so as to support the basis of their bid. And how long does that take for that to be approved or disapproved? We are required to issue, uh, in, in terms of whether or not the refund obligation accrues as to those transactions, 60 days at the most. Okay. Uh, how did they arrive at this threshold of $150? Uh, the commission looked at what it had in terms of the, prior to that period, we had a soft cap effect of December 8th because of discussions we had on the emergency filing with the ISO. Prior to that day, we had a 250 price cap. There was a concern, uh, uh, the commission addressed that we will go do an initial screen and they felt that 150 was appropriate figure at that point for just an initial screen. Let's see here. What, uh, I guess, so the goal of the soft price cap is to uh, keep prices down. Well, the, the, the is goal, that the goal of it? Uh, the goal is to provide the necessary supply where you need it and at the same time review the transactions, the bids that come in to ensure that the rates are appropriate. And that was one of the key things we did in our March 9th. So order. you reviewed that and the, and the goal then ultimately is to keep the price as low as possible. Keep it re while attracting supply, okay. necessary supply. And is that is that working? Um, there, there have, it depends on what one believes as what's, what's the appropriate price. Uh, we, in our March 9th order, determined for, from the January period that the appropriate price would be $273. So at which point those, those transactions which occurred higher than that, would, the sellers would be required to either refund those monies or show that their actual cost were higher than that. And the basis for that is that we looked at the gas prices in, in um, January, which were 12.50 on average. You looked at the NOx cost, which is 22.50, and we looked at the average pounds taken for a uh, combustion turbine, and we arrived at a 273 dollar price. If I might ask one more question, then I'll have more questions after that Certainly. in the next round. 
Uh, Mr. Uh, Winter, uh, you requested FERC's December order, is that right? That's Well, the December 8th order, the December 15th order was one that was a follow-up, I believe, to their uh, November decision and was a final order in December. Is that correct? No, the November order was a draft order where we saw comments on the right. remedies proposed and the December 15th order is the initial order and that's on rehearing. So okay. so you, you did order that December 8th. 8th order, okay. Why? Well, as I explained before, I was suddenly... Well, if, I, if I missed it, I'm sorry. I, I don't want you to be redundant, but... Yeah, I, I just explained that I had seen the prices go way above the price cap of 250 and I was not able to get power to serve the... So it was an emergency? Yes. Okay. I'll come back for questions later. I'd like to follow up on Chairman Burton's. If I understand correctly, uh, there's been a suggestion that your December 8th application to FERC for emergency increase in the price of power was inappropriate. And yet, I think my basic question is whether or not you had the authority to make that December 8th request of FERC. So well, did you have the authority to make that request? Clearly under uh, the other board, uh, yes, I did. What do you and mean the other board? The stakeholder board that was in effect at that time. Uh, anytime the market has a tremendous uh, uh, change, in other words, in 1998 we had uh, a my, bid my, of... My yeah. question deals more with procedurally. You were fully authorized under state statute to make that, recommend make that request to FERC. Yes, in emergency situations, I have the authority to do so that. So nobody came to you beforehand and said, don't do this. They, said, they actually said quite the opposite. They said, we need to do this. Or you made that no, I made that judgment based on what was going on on the floor and my inability to serve the load of California. And that was well within your statutory authority under AB 1890. Uh, I don't know what AB 1890 says, but as the operator of the system, that's clearly in my authority. And under the FERC tariff, I have the authority to do that in emergencies. Okay. Now I recognize uh, Mr. Horn for 10 minutes. This is probably going over one of the colleagues here, but we might as well look at it. Uh, how vital uh, is the open communication and cooperation between agencies? I would ask uh, Ms. Lynch. Uh, what tools does the California Public Utilities Commission use to communicate and coordinate efforts with other agencies, including the California Energy Commission? What is their communication there, and what is their role in relation to your role? Sure. The California Energy Commission uh, cites power plants and also does research work on power trends. So they publish reports and such about consumption, supply, and power plants in California. The Public Utilities Commission regulates the investor-owned utilities in the provision of power in California. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission regulates the wholesale price of power charged by the private generators who own power plants that are not utilities. We have quite a good working relationship with the other state entities in California that have jurisdiction over energy matters. Does the California Energy Commission make recommendations to you on the need for power, or is that simply left for the uh, community, uh, the uh, California Public Utility Commission that you chair? No, the power siting, the power plant siting uh, authority resides in the Energy Commission. And the Energy Commission for decades uh, participated in integrated resource planning to plan out the power needs of the state. In the Wilson administration, the state stepped back and said the state is not going to take a look at the power needs overall in California. We'll leave that to the market. So there was a dearth of planning and building for critical years in the 1990s. As the power consumption rose, the state stepped back for ideological reasons, and that is one of the reasons we find ourselves in the pickle in terms of supply that we have today. Governor Davis stepped forward and Governor Davis is pushing the private market to build those power plants, streamlining all the environmental regulations, getting every obstacle possible out of the way to get more supply because for the past eight years, the prior administrations didn't do the job to ensure supply for California. They let the market do it and the market failed. Would the gentleman yield? Yeah. The department, not the department, the California Energy Commission has a website. 
and on that website they post their uh, projections for power demand at some point in the future. Those projections commenced being developed in 1988 for the year 2001. And the projections by the California Energy Commission since 1988 have consistently shown a demand for power in excess of 50,000 megawatts. And it's a biannual, every two years they update it. So it's just, it's been a continual stream. We're gonna need 51,000, 52,000 megawatts of power in the year 2001. Now let's say that uh, their figure is right. Uh, you're, what you're telling me is it's a commission that isn't doing much of anything. And mm -hmm. could your own commission uh, be able to uh, pass on sites and I take it it does, does it? Well, Mr. Horn, actually, I'm not saying that the Energy Commission isn't doing anything. I applaud the Energy Commission's efforts over the past two years to streamline their processes. And in fact, they have 16 plants through the permit process, and nine of them, might be six, I'm actually forgetting the number right now, are currently under construction. And that's more plants under construction and permitted in the state of California in the past two years than in the prior two administrations combined. So the California Energy Commission is turning cartwheels to make sure we got enough supply in California. Problem is you can't build a plant in just a couple months. It takes a while for to attract the investment to get the folks to go through the process. Just, They're going through the process now. The problem just, was the dearth in the past. Just for the record, I assume all of uh, Governor Davis's uh, appointees are on the California Energy Commission. Those are pleasure appointments, are they, of the governor? No, they're term they're appointments. Term. And he received his third majority uh, appointment in January of 2001. What is it, the total number? Total of five. Five, so he now has a majority on that as of January. That's correct. Okay. Now, what's the role, if any, Mr. Madden, in the Federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission? Uh, do you also pass on some of these uh, selections for sites and development of electricity and power? The the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has no jurisdiction over the siting of transmission facilities. That's just up to the, each state? It's up to the particular states, yes. Okay, now the California, and we're talking really about uh, cooperation and communication with, with Ms. Lynch, California Independent Systems Operator, Mr. Winter, I take it? Yes. So, do you talk to each other? Uh, I think we do now more to more than we have in the past, although this summer when we had energy issues, uh, when there was a blackout on June 14th, Mr. Winter was uh, quite helpful and cooperative. The problem really was the ISO tariffs, which prevented governmental agencies from getting the same information that market participants could get. Mr. Uh, the Chairman Burton noted that uh, there's a lot of finger pointing in all directions. And uh, you're saying that you don't have that many finger pointing unless you're perhaps here. I don't know. So uh, here he is. And uh, you can talk to each other. And I certainly talk to the members of the board of the yeah. ISO on a regular basis. As the, as you all know, as the, as a private corporation in the state of California, it really does fall to the board to set the policy direction for the ISO. Mm -hmm. Are you automatically, or the person in your position, automatically a member of that group? No, I'm not at all. You're not. So there isn't any linkage uh, generally, and it just has to be whether people talk to each other or don't. I think that Governor Davis ensures that his appointees work together. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the uh, California ISO, namely Mr. Winter, uh, investigated evidence of market abuse. I believe you did this. Is this correct? And reported its findings in a report issued in March 2001. That's correct. Uh, and they project that power generators have overcharged California by 6.2 billion between May 2000, February 2001. Make a uh, unit, much as the uh, FERC had done, determine what its heat rates were. Uh, factor in the price of natural gas during this time frame, um, factor in the cost of emissions, and arrive at a at a uh, what we call a cost-based uh, rate 
then we allowed the market to have some bit of flexibility and then everything above that which we're calling the, uh, the competitive market price we considered to be uh, uh, overcharge if that's the term I believe you're using. Mm -hmm. How about the Federal Commission in terms of putting the pieces together on whether gouging occurred or didn't occur? Uh, Congressman, are you referring to the $6.2 billion? Right. Six point two billion. Well, as we because uh, that's the figure the public heard. That's why I'm going after. As that. we discussed earlier, the six point two two billion dollar figure was that which the ISO submitted. As I recall now, the ISO recognizes that of the six point two billion, a substantial portion portion of that is non jurisdictional. That would be the forty seven percent. That is not. I I don't know what the numbers are for mm -hmm. sure. And uh, another portion of that would be prior to October 2nd, 2000, in which this commission, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has no authority to require refunds pursuant to the November draft order and the opinion is taken there. He also mentioned that a substantial portion, I don't know how much, referred to bilateral contracts or involved bilateral contracts. That's where you have mutual agreement between the parties. Um, that is not subject to refund. The real-time spot market is subject to refund. He also mentioned just now in terms of how he factored in the cost, and he mentioned a thermal unit. Thermal unit, we factored in for, your, for the committee's information a combined a CT. Uh, combined turbines, which has a higher efficiency rate than, than does usually a thermal. Um, he factored in gas costs and NOx costs, but I, don't, I do not, and, we, and this is why we requested information, ask him what were those costs. Now, you get the Bonneville Power Authority records, I suspect, since that is a federal entity. Do they file with you as to well, what they're the, generating? The, the PMA, Bonneville, is non-jurisdictional to us. It's a non-jurisdictional seller, although under, under a limited portion of the Act, we can review the rates for a very limited circumstances, the actual rates they charge. Now, I take it that the municipal utilities, such as those of the City of Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, do you have or not don't have jurisdiction over that? We do not have jurisdiction over entities like that. We have no jurisdiction for the most part over munis and co-ops. And if you look at behind the six point two billion dollar figure, a substantial amount of those alleged refunds or overcharges are associated with entities that we do not have jurisdiction over. Would uh, anything be in the Department of Energy where they might collect those records? Uh, the Department of, well, in terms of jurisdiction, the U.S. Department of Energy has no jurisdiction over the co-ops or munis. Mm -hmm. It does have jurisdiction, but oversees the Bonneville Power Administration as, as it does oversee the other power marketing administration. You have to, have to look at the organic statutes or the charters that created the co-ops or munis within each particular state. Would the gentleman yield? Yeah, I was going to say the chairman is an expert on some of the figures of federal dams, so you ought to put that on the record. I right want now. actually want to follow up on uh, where you were driving as it relates to the munis in particular. I believe the ISO, on occasion, purchases surplus power from the munis for distribution elsewhere. Uh, I'm not sure what I you know, mean by distribution elsewhere, but yes, uh, to serve the ISO grid, uh, we get power from Department of Water and Power, to, clearly, to distribute to other people in the state of California. Now, we just heard Mr. Madden say that FERC has no jurisdiction over such entities. Just would you uh, kindly share with us your recollection of the prices being paid by the ISO for that power? From the Department of Water and Power? As an example, yes. Um, well, clearly, we were paying the market price to everyone, which uh, at the point that we went over the 250 price cap, those would range all the way from 250 up to five, $600. I can't remember exactly. Who, who has jurisdiction over the prices charged by munis selling into the wholesale market? I assume they're uh, governing. Uh, 
agencies, be that a city of uh, city council and Department of Water and Power. I but say. they're not subject to FERC's jurisdiction. No, they're, they're non-jurisdictional. Not. Are they, Miss Miss Lynch? Are they subject to PUC jurisdiction? No, we have jurisdiction over retail rates charged by investor-owned utilities, not municipal utilities. From your recollection, Mr. Winter, this report, did you break out, for instance, either in aggregate or by individual muni entity? How much of the 6.2 billion in overcharges was were made? I believe there is a confidential attachment submitted to FERC, but I, I have not seen it myself. And you know, I'm getting tired of being told I can't have information. <laughs> I suspect there are people in the state who share that opinion. Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to provide that information. Um, it, I assume if it's cumulative data. We have to decide that issue in any event because we have the filing at the commission and we have to look at the six it's point separated out and separate it out and compare it to what we've done, for example, in our March 9th ref refund order. So I will be glad to provide the committee with that information. We will be in contact with you. Thank okay. you. I'll yield back to the gentleman. From the I yield back to you. Uh, I think we've got the people from rec uh, uh, reclamation and we ought to go into that They'll, they are actually joining us later today okay if, I think I believe it's my uh, is it my 10 minutes can I give you this all right it is my 10 minutes I want to examine a couple things if I might uh, I want to go with these the issue of long-term contracts because it seems to me that the opportunity to hedge exposures either by PG&E or Southern California Edison or San Diego offers the opportunity to effectively eliminate the uncertainty or the lack of supply that might otherwise occur. It's my understanding that AB 1890 did not require the utilities to purchase all of their electricity through the PX. Is that correct? Does anybody know the answer to that? There's no specific language in 1890 that says the utilities must buy from the PX. I believe that's true. I believe that was the decision of my predecessors in order to create the PX and have it up and running that they required the utilities to buy through the PX. So PUC adopted a rule that said investor-owned utilities must buy through the PX. Yes, the past that, PUC The past did. PUC. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, they must sell into and buy from. It's a buy-sell deal. Right, correct. Has this PUC ever examined whether or not to revoke that requirement? Yes, we did. And what was your determination? At the time, based on conversations I had with Republican legislators who were active in creating the PX, they asked us to keep that buy-sell requirement. Did you talk to any Democratic legislators? I did, actually. I believe Senator Peace asked me to keep that requirement as well. So it was, and it was bipartisan? Law. At the time, last, uh, I believe it was June. Okay. Um, nonetheless, I appreciate you making that clear. Nonetheless, the PUC voted to allow the utilities to um, to not uh, do uh, buy and sell exclusively through the PX in June, and the legislature changed that in a bill at the end of June. How did you vote on that issue? I voted to keep the utilities buying and selling through the PX. Okay, so you were you were asking that the, if you will, the transparency issue be maintained. That's correct, and at the request of legislators who, uh, who were there at the time AB 1890 passed, uh, with their understanding of what their intent was. I just come back to my earlier point. I don't understand why it is every, every time I ask about the PX or the ISO or something like that, I hear this mantra of disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. And yet when I ask the question and when my constituents ask me, why can't we find out what commitments the governor is making of the state of California's treasury, I'm told I'm not qualified to hear that. Now. Who is it that I got to ask to get that information? Does anybody know? Do I have to issue a subpoena from this committee to get Ms. that information? Mr. Chairman, um, 
As I mentioned earlier, I have asked the ISO to provide, the Commission has asked the ISO to provide that information in terms of what they know about it. If they can't get that information, I can assure you that this Commission will ask the generators who have entered into those negotiations with the state to provide us with the information. And I will have to go back and review the law, but I can probably provide that under confidentiality to the do, committee. Do I understand these contracts that are being considered by the state of California to be long-term contracts? As I understand it, and, and I'm not an expert in the area, um, they're, they're short, they're, they're, there's a combination of short-term, mid-term, and long-term with different types of provisions. So they have different tranches of exposure. That's correct. That's, are, that's correct. Ms. Lynch, are those contracts subject to PUC review? No. Because? Uh, because AB1X uh, transfers the just and reasonableness review of the power purchases to the Department of Water Resources from the PUC. Who's held accountable for that decision? Of If the D DW... DWR makes a decision that something's unjust or unreasonable, or conversely, something at a price up here is just or reasonable. Exactly how do the voters of this state hold someone accountable? Does anybody have the answer to that question? The PUC doesn't have the jurisdiction to re review that question. Okay, in terms of DWR's contracts. That's correct. Okay. Let me go back to my original question. In. Uh, March of 99, Southern California Edison filed with the PUC for authority to enter into bilateral contracts as part of a pilot program designed to provide market stability and increased supply. Now, if I'm correct, that is prior to when you were made president of the PUC. It's prior to my membership on the PUC. Okay. In July of 99, the PUC rejected that request from Southern California Edison because, the, in effect, as you said earlier, forcing the buy-sell transaction through the PX provides transparency, mitigates market power, and reduces regulatory burden. Now, since you've gotten there, Ms. Lynch, my question is whether you have any comments about forcing the IOUs and the, into or through the PX and the consequences of that requirement? Well, uh, the IOUs asked for additional authority to buy various hedging products that were available through the PX, and we granted that authority. And then, in addition, the utilities asked for additional authority to enter into direct bilateral uh, sales only scheduled through the PX but not purchased that way and we granted that authority. So from that perspective the utilities had uh, the full panoplies of tools in their toolbox to hedge their risk. I think what no one could have foreseen was the dramatic upward spiral of the market prices as demonstrated by the chart in front of you that I provided uh, because I believe no one could have foreseen that the, that the price caps would have been blown out as they were. I want to yield for a question. Mr. Yeah, I, 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 there was an article and what paper was that? San Francisco Chronicle. And I want to read you just a little bit of this. Maybe you can explain this to me. It says, on July 21st, Edison and PG&E filed emergency requests. This is last year. With the PUC seeking authority to sign longer-term contracts directly with generators to protect themselves from surging prices. Their cause appeared to be bolstered by the August 2nd report that Davis, I presume, Governor, requested from the PUC and the Electricity Oversight Board, which clearly said the state spot markets were exacerbating price spiking and the contracts between the utilities and power producers were needed. Sources say some state economists feared that signing a five-year contract at $50 per megawatt hour could harm the economy. The day after the report was released, the PUC voted to let the utilities sign bilateral contracts through December 31st, 2005, subject to a review of reasonableness. But the utilities now say that the vote was meaningless because the commission staff refused to pre-approve contracts as reasonable after a 30-day review as the commission's order directed. And, and, and what, what I've been told by staff and other people is that the utilities were very concerned because the contract, the long-term contract, was subject to a, a review of reasonableness. 
So if they signed a long-term contract at $50 per megawatt hour and uh, the price on the spot market and everything started dropping below that, they were locked into the $50 per megawatt hour and they could be socked with a demand for return. And they didn't think that was reasonable because they were assuming risk and if the price dropped, they were up the creek because they'd have to refund a, a, a lot of money. Why is it that the why is it your office didn't uh, allow them to sign a long-term contract without this subject to a, re a review of reasonableness down the road? Sure. I mean, you know, for instance, if I'm a small businessman. I enter into a contract, and they say, hey, it's subject to a, a review of reasonableness, and I've made this agreement, and five years down the road, uh, after I signed the contract in good faith, they say, hey, well, you could have gotten it at $40 per kilo megawatt hour. And then I'm supposed to return that large amount of money, and it could cost me a ton and put me into bankruptcy. So why was that reasonable clause not allowed to be taken out of there? On a unanimous vote, two weeks after the utilities asked for the authority to enter into bilateral contracts, the PUC did give the utilities the authority to enter into bilateral contracts, and then they entered into bilateral contracts. I am prevented for for confidentiality reasons of telling the public exactly what they entered into, but I can tell you they entered into significant bilateral contracts. What the PUC well, there did... There was a lot more, though, than the $50 per megawatt hour. Uh, some of them have been, yes. Well, but, but prior to that time, if that reasonableness clause had not been in there, they could have gotten it at $50 per megawatt hour. And some of, they, some of them they did, and some of them they did less than that. I can't discuss the specifics, but it was a full range you, of prices. Well, but I will excuse say me just one second. You know, the, chair, the chairman of the subcommittees, you know, and the people who are watching are seeing that everything's under the veil of confidentiality. We can't get this. We can't get that. We can't get this. We represent the Congress of the United States and federal agencies that participate in some of these processes. We want that information. And if I have to subpoena that information from you, I will do it. So I want you to give it to us. Now, if it's something that should not be in the public domain, then we'll honor that. But we want to see that information. And to be pounded time and again after we came well, at least I came out here, these guys live here. But after me coming out here and having, you know, hearings and packing my suitcase and moving all over the state day after day to have these hearings, I don't want you to tell me we can't have that information because of confidentiality. I want it. I'd be happy to give it to you consistent with my state mandates. You can get it from the utilities. It's their information, and I as a regulator cannot give their confidential information without their permission. So I'd be happy to give it to you confidentially. If you'd like it out in public, you can ask them for it. It's theirs to give. Okay, but I want to find out about this reasonableness clause. Sure. And you say that that reasonableness clause was, was, was done away with so that they could go ahead and enter into these long-term contracts without additional risk. But what I've been told is that it was after the the cow was out of the barn, the $50 rate that they could have gotten for long-term contracts was then going up, skyrocketing up, and they, if they entered into long-term contracts, it was, a, it was a, at a much higher rate because you folks kept that reasonable, reason, reasonableness clause in there until the $50 uh, uh, rate was no longer available. Well, the reasonableness clause is still in there, and they did sign contracts below $50 in some instances. But why we kept the reasonableness clause in there is because every other state also has a reasonableness review. That is the fundamental basis of a regulated entity. You, as a small business person, don't get a guaranteed profit, which is what state law gives to the utilities. They get to recover their costs, guaranteed, no doubt about it. The only check on that cost recovery is a reasonableness review. And the Public Utilities Commission of the State of California had good reason to continue what every other state today well, still does, let, let, which let. is a historical fact pattern which showed abuses in the past between the utilities contracting with their affiliates. I understand, and, you're, and, 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 and there may be some justification for price gouging by the utilities, but the fact of the matter is, if you look back at the thing that you no, gave... No, Mr. Chairman, you want to say there may have been some justification for the reasonable re review due to okay due to okay but let's, <laughs> let, 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 let's just take a look here you could see you could see from your from your uh, uh, chart here that the the the, the price per uh, uh, megawatt was jumping at a dramatic rate and they were saying you know we can lock this thing at fifty dollars per megawatt hour and because uh, of this reasonableness uh, uh, clause in there 
uh, they were worried that they were going to really uh, lose their shirt if they signed that at that time. And it seems to me that that's something that, that was a reasonable thing for them to be concerned about. Well, every state has a reasonableness review in order to protect the ratepayers, and as does California. What we did, it's not just for long-term contracts, it's a reasonableness in their actions so that they don't go out and, you know, buy very expensive nuclear power that's a hundred times what the original cost was uh, because they have the guaranteed well, rate let, of return. Let me, just, let me just make one more point. Okay. You didn't work with them on this, and it seems to me you should have, and instead of being able to get it at $50 per kilowatt hour, in December it was up to $377 per kilowatt hour. So uh, you, could see, you could see from this chart that it went from $31.18 per kilowatt hour up to $47.22 in May per kilowatt hour, and then in June it jumped to $120 per kilowatt hour, and, and the, dis the discussion, according to this article, uh, was, was in July, after it had already jumped over $120 per kilowatt hour, and they were trying to negotiate for $50 per, for, per megawatt hour, pardon me, and uh, you wouldn't do it. We did. We let them in two weeks' time, which is lightning speed for the PUC. We gave them full authority up to their full average net short, and guess what? They actually contracted for power. What they didn't do was fill up their full net short because nobody was going to believe at the time that the FERC was going to blow out the price caps and the average price of power every day of every hour in December was $378 right. after FERC blew out the price caps and the generators had a field day with California's economy. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, may I reclaim my time? Yeah, I do want to. I'd be happy to. One give question certain. on this issue Is the uh, California Utilities Commission under the Ralph Brown Act? Are you familiar with that? The, the Public Process, yes. Public Meetings Act, yes. Yeah, well, the fact is that sure, you don't uh, make it public uh, until the decision's made. But once the decision is made, you can uh, announce that to the press. You can answer the chairman's question. Uh, right now, it has no violation of law that I'm aware of under any state agency. So why don't you answer him? Oh, sure. All of our decisions are public, and they're public before we vote on them, as was our August 3rd decision, which allowed the utilities to bilaterally contract up to their full power needs on average. And that's out there, and I'd be happy to provide you. I'll, we can uh, messenger it over right well, now with those decisions. you saying you can't because of all the industry and all that. Well, we that can't. had nothing to do once they are on the market and they've done it that uh, you could have released that afterwards. I can realize you couldn't do it, what you were going to do in the uh, commission, because that might affect the market in, a, in another way, which is bond stocks and so forth. Well, the statute says that the utilities are entitled to keep the information confidential when they're buying and thereafter. For instance, they bought power ahead in the market. What disadvantages the utilities as a buyer is if I release how much power they bought because then all the generators can figure out how much power is left that they need to buy. So if the utilities don't have to play all their cards, then the generators don't know if they need to buy a lot or a little. So the generators then will bid more competitively if they don't know exactly the utilities' needs, which is why I can't give to the public the utilities' business confidential data. Well, I don't know why not, because now they're into bankruptcy and everything else. And it uh, seems to me it ought to all be on the record. Well, if they'd like to waive the confidentiality provisions, they can provide the data, and um, I could then provide it to you. But right now, the way their business confidential data works is because I have special access as a regulator to their business confidential data, I need to keep it confidential unless, uh, you know, we have a prior conversation about that with the utilities. Let me see. Uh, gentlemen, yield to me. I would. Mr. Makovich, uh, as I understand it, and I think you're totally familiar with this, uh, when they were concerned about this review of reasonableness, uh, they wanted to have, what, 20 percent as a, as a uh, uh, percentage that they should be accountable for, and the, you, the commission wanted only 5 percent. Is that correct? As, as outside of a reasonableness range, yes. Yeah, okay. Is 5% as the commission wanted it to be a, a reasonable standard for this kind of a problem across no. the country? Uh, long-term power prices are very, very hard to predict. And to enter into a long-term contract of the type that have been signed, 4 to 20 years, 
that kind of a margin of error is far too low. What would you, what would be a reasonable margin of error? Uh, well, my uh, testimony has been I think long-term contracts are not the right solution to this problem. Uh, uh, they're not going to solve this shortage problem. Uh, but the, the, the long-term contracting, there is a, a liquid uh, futures market for power now that goes out about uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, so it's very, very clear what the market expectation is. And what for is power. that? Uh, everywhere else in the U.S., it ranges from uh, 20 to 30 dollars, depending upon the month, up to maybe 100 dollars. In California, it's in the three to 500 dollar range as we look out across the next year. I'm not sure I understand that. Maybe I'm missing something here. But as I understood it, the utilities, when they went to the commission, wanted a 20 percent right reasonableness standard. Reasonableness right. standard, and five percent was what the commission wanted. Wanted. Right. Even and the 20 percent is probably a mistake. I understand, yeah. but the utilities were willing to do that, mm -hmm. and because they couldn't get that, they didn't lock in. Right the rate at $50 per megawatt hour. Right. Why, is, why is it that the, the commission wouldn't go along with that 20 percent, which is, sounds like it's a fairly reasonable standard, instead of the 5 percent which they were standing fast on? Well, as Mr. Makovich just demonstrated, many economists uh, actually objected to our decision to give them long-term contracting authority on a bilateral basis whatsoever. So it was striking a reasonable balance at the time, given the market, because many people, like Mr. Makovich, would probably criticize the decision of the Public Utilities Commission to give the utilities full throttle ahead on buying whatever they'd like to meet their next short. So from that perspective, uh, I think that the Commission probably went over what some economists thought was prudent at the time. What we wanted to do was give the utilities the flexibility to run their business as they saw fit. And they did buy power at five cents, some less and some more over time. So I think that the assumption that they didn't buy um, at all is actually not uh, proven <coughs> true by the facts. But the utilities have the specific facts that I would encourage them to share with you. We're going to talk to them tomorrow, I think. Isn't that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to go back to a uh, question that I have. In terms of the long-term contracts themselves, have you had any direct communication with utility executives uh, advising for or against using long-term contracts? Well, the way the commission works is the utilities bring in an application and then there's a pending matter before us that parties can comment on. So I've certainly seen their materials as they've, you know, presented as a party to me and considered those materials carefully when we gave them the authority that they requested. My question was whether or not you've had any communications with utility executives advising for or against long-term contracts. I, I don't understand the advising for or against. Do you mean have giving you them my policy you, pronouncement? Have you talked with utility executives privately or publicly in favor of or against the use of long-term contracts? Uh, well, certainly publicly by my votes and statements regarding my support for long-term contracts. And privately, I, I don't recall. Now, if I, if I understand your support, there, the caveats are that they go through the PX and that they be within the 5% uh, margin that Mr. Makovich was talking about? For pre-approval. But they would always just be subject to the normal reasonableness review that all other states uh, give to, those, to essentially any procurement actions of the utilities. So the, pre the, the, the retrospective reasonableness re approval is a, a review is a, a function of what a prudent utility would do at the time when faced with those facts at the time. So it's a question in time. It's not that you can apply tomorrow's standards to today's actions. You apply today's standards to today's actions, as all the other states do. Are you familiar with Doug Long's letter to the two utilities objecting to their methodology for entering into long-term bilateral contracts? I know there's lots of correspondence that goes between my staff and utilities on a variety of matters. I don't know which particular letter you're referring to. Well, Doug Long is the uh, gentleman on the California Energy Commission, California Energy Division, who apparently has staff jurisdiction over the question of forward contracting. 
Am I correct on that? He's one of the managers in the energy division. Okay. Now, it's my understanding from uh, feedback I've had directly that he has opposed very, very strenuously the methodology put forward by the utilities to try and hedge their exposures. Is that consistent with your understanding? My understanding is the commission made a decision which is then the policy of the regulator to allow the utilities to move forward consistent with uh, reasonableness reviews that are in place in every other state. Okay. The standards, one of the questions I have as a business person is I like to think of certainty when I'm entering into an application in front of a government agency. We've heard back and forth about is this one reasonable, is that one not reasonable. The question I have is, was there ever a point at which the PUC undertook to define in a prospective basis what was reasonable and what wasn't reasonable? Actually, yes. Um, based on uh and I'm not recalling specifically why I thought the utilities wanted further guidance, but it could well have been a conversation. I just don't recall. Did that, um, did that occur like in August, September, March? I mean, how long are we talking about? In the fall, uh, because by November, I decided to go ahead and provide additional guidance, which I put for a vote of the commission in December. So I put it on our agenda, essentially, for additional guidance at the time. Are those reasonable standards now adopted by the PUC? They're not, because at that point, I believe I put it on for a vote at the right, at right uh, well, we put it on before we knew, I think we're right around the time that the FERC blew out the price caps. And so the anticipation was that it would be at least under the soft caps that the FERC had proposed. The actuality then, when prices shot up five times in five days in the California market, it, that that oh, let, volatile market then outstripped the let, parameters let, that I was proposing. Let, let me go back to the standards. I think that was the basis of my question, not, not what FERC did or didn't do. If I understand correctly, then PUC still has not issued a final determination for use by the investor-owned utilities as to what is or isn't a reasonable standard for forward contracting? The reason I mentioned FERC is because the market determines, we have to understand the market to be able to determine what's reasonable, and the okay, market has been so out of whack in let's California. Let's cut through all that. Has PUC issued standards for reasonable or unreasonable forward contracts for use by the investor-owned utility? We issued our original standards in August. I provided some additional further guidance that I put on the agenda, and thereafter the utilities stopped buying on the spot. So it was uh, essentially useless for the utilities since they weren't buying on the spot anymore. So are those standards final? No, they're not. So you haven't completed the process? Uh, well, it's really the market outstripped our ability to determine what uh, was reasonable in California. So going back to my question is, you don't have standards defining what is or isn't reasonable in terms of forward contracts for the investor-owned utilities? No, we do have initial standards that we adopted and put in place unanimously on August 3rd. Yeah, are those they, are final. They have, they have binding protection, safe harbors for the investor-owned utilities? There are some safe harbors, yes, but they wanted further guidance, and we have not refined with further guidance. So do you have final standards defining what is or isn't reasonable for long-term contracts for investor-owned utilities? Yes, our August 3rd standards are final. We could do additional refinements, which I proposed, which we have not finished. But, but we, have for, we have guidance that we adopted on August 3rd. The utilities wanted additional guidance. We started designing additional guidance, and then they dropped out of the market. Could we get to when August is? Is it which August century? August of 2000. Huh? August of 2000. Okay. Mr. Makovich, in terms of the buy-sell provisions of the PX, would you care to offer any insights as to the value of forcing those contracts? That's the wrong word directing those contracts through the PX. Do you have any opinion on that? Right. Well, 
in retrospect, the $50 per megawatt hour would have been a good deal uh, for utilities to be able to lock into. The problem, the people have then looked at that and said, well, the problem to this whole, pro uh, this whole crisis is if the utilities had simply been allowed to lock into long-term contracts, we could have avoided this whole mess. And I think that's not right. That's wrong. And the reason for that is, if you allowed people to sign long-term contracts, let's say that voluntarily 80% of electric demand was covered under long-term contracts. The problem you've got then is those contracts are supplied from both existing plants. Actually, the contracts that have been signed are mostly from existing plants. You're not building any new power plants. If you then end up with a shortage, and that's what we've got, we are fundamentally short of power plants, you cannot enforce on residential customers those that are covered by long-term contracts and those that are not. So unless the long-term contracts are mandated to cover 120% of the market to also provide you a reserve, they are not going to be the mechanism that builds enough capacity. If they did, if long-term contracts, assume that you got 120% voluntarily, the evidence is if you do not have a shortage, the spot market clears on the basis of fuel and variable costs alone. Energy traders would then attack the long-term contract market. They would sell long, buy off the spot market, and arbitrage out any capacity payment that would be involved in those long-term contracts. And the only way to prevent them would be to have a shortage that discipline that activity. Okay, before, I want to, yeah. you're going to have to speak in, in language I understand and can communicate with. Okay. Does that mean prices to consumers are higher or lower? Prices to consumers would, I think, be terribly higher if you forced long-term contracting. Remember, 50% of the stranded costs when we started this whole process in California were long-term energy contracts signed at what people thought would be reasonable rates out in the future, which were the PERPA contracts. If the IOUs had the option of entering into long-term contracts to meet the load that they are historically familiar with, right. does the same conclusion hold? No. The right time of type of long-term contract would be to require people that serve electric customers to sign capacity contracts. There's no reason to commit to the energy, to the utilization of the power plants. They need to pay people to have enough capacity to meet those future peak loads and then simply have the option to run those power plants to produce the energy that they need. So a request from a power or an IOU such as PG&E or Southern California Edison or San Diego to have the hedging tool that a forward contract provides be available but not a mandate, right. you think would lead to lower prices? If you required people that produced, that, that served customers with electric energy, they were, if they were required to also have enough capacity to meet their peaks, then you would create a market in which long-term contracting for capacity would be the mechanism by which that capacity payment is made. And then you are paying people to have enough capacity so you don't have a shortage. Thank you. I understand that. Okay. All right. Okay. Their eyes all rolled over. I got it. <laughs> I want to go, I have one final question, and then the others will happen. Uh, Ms. Lynch, the PUC recently recharacterized a certain amount of capital that PG&E or Southern California Edison or San Diego, I don't know whether San Diego Gas, to change it from uh, stranded investment to, if I understand correctly, advanced payment for future power purchases. And I'm trying to figure out why that happened. Well, I mean, what's, explain that to me, if you would. What's, sure. what's transpiring there? It's an accounting, it's a regulatory accounting treatment where um, under the auspices of AB 1890, two accounts were set up. One was for payment of their stranded assets, and one was for payment of their I, I like to characterize it as operating costs versus capital costs, okay. although I think that that's oversimplifying it. Um, the uh, former PUC said, you can 
ex essentially accelerate the depreciation of your capital assets in three ways. You can make a profit off the rates that are charged and uh, essentially match that up against an accelerated depreciation schedule. You can sell off your plants and the, the profits used from that would also accelerate okay. depreciation. And then uh, you can also, there, there was the revenue from the rate payer, there was the revenue that they made themselves from their retained generation because they were selling that retained generation in the market. And then there was the plant sales. So three different revenue streams that could pay off their capital costs on an accelerated basis. In fact, reduced to zero the basis that they had in those plants. That was the goal of AB okay. 1890. And the bargain was that they got to accelerate the depreciation of their capital costs, which many people at the time thought were stranded assets, in order to assume the risk on a going forward basis of their power purchases, of their operating costs. So rather than having the guarantee of the regulatory compact that their costs would be covered, they took a bargain. They said, we'll get money up front for accelerated depreciation of capital if we take the back end risk of power purchase liabilities. What the PUC did in essence was say, hey, wait a minute, some of those revenues that you originally counted against accelerating your capital cost recovery were actually operating revenues. You got money from the rate payers in their bills, which on an, on an ongoing basis. You also got money from selling your own generation into the market. Oh, yeah. And that in fact, your power purchase liability should be netted against your power purchase revenues before you get to transfer all those revenues over for accelerated depreciation of your capital costs. So what the PUC said was, it's time to true up the books. It's time to net out your operating costs and revenues before you just take the revenues and match them against your capital costs. Because essentially, you're prepaying your mortgage before you pay your power bill or your life bill or your grocery bill. So we're saying you got to pay your bills, your, your operating costs first, and then if you have money left over, you can prepay your mortgage. But you don't get to prepay your mortgage and then come back to the ratepayers and say, please help me with my monthly bills. This is, the PUC made this determination recently, if I recall. On March 27th. It would seem to me that the logic that you've just elucidated would also have held prior to the investor-owned utilities advising folks that they had recovered their entire stranded costs. I'm trying to understand why this decision wasn't made last year at this time instead of six months after the investor-owned utilities had advised everybody that you know they were ready to be free of 1890. Well, the investor-owned utilities came into the commission and applied for what they called a rate stabilization plan in October. And in that proceeding thereafter, some consumer groups came in and said, hey, wait a minute, when we're looking at the true up of all the accounting, you should make sure that uh, operating costs are netted against operating liabilities before you apply them to capital costs. And so the PUC had a public proceeding where we took evidence from all sorts of parties and had lots of hearings from the period of October through March before we made the decision. So we did have evidentiary hearings and had full opportunity for public comment before we made the decision. But the decision, the question arose in October and we fully vetted it in public over the intervening months. But I will say this, we did take a little bit longer time in that decision um, because we put to the head of the pack the question of a rate increase. And so we originally granted a rate increase in January and that did take precedence to this accounting true up question. Is the issue of this recharacterization, is that the substance of the lawsuits in federal court right now between the IOUs and the PUC? Well, I have to say the utilities have thrown in the kitchen sink and claims, and so I'm not exactly uh, sure their list of claims today. Right. I'd have to go back and check. This, this well could be one of them. They're, they're, the essence of their claim is that they should be entitled to recover whatever they pay for power purchase costs, regardless of how much they got to prepay their mortgage in the past. They're taking the position they've re under 1890 that they have recovered their stranded costs and therefore should be relieved of... Uh, the subsequent or the precedent requirements thereof. 
they're taking the position that they don't have to true up their operating costs before they transfer operating revenues over to the capital side. You're arguing over definitions of what's an operating cost versus a capital cost. Is that what you're saying? Uh, it's an accounting treatment question, but I think that the utilities filed rate doctrine case actually involves much more than the accounting treatment. It involves the fundamental principle of whether a state under state jurisdiction to control the retail rate paid by the ratepayer has authority to shape the rate over time and to and whether a state has the authority to pass a statute like AB 1890 which gave a bargain and a risk to the utilities or whether instead when the federal government allows market rates on the wholesale level to fluctuate whether the state has to pass those volatile costs through in real time without shaping the retail rate so it's a larger policy question that's really an issue in the filed rate doctrine case I have two quick questions. I hope they're quick. Uh, we heard from the other panel and uh, about the cost, high cost of natural gas and how it's driven the costs of their businesses uh, through the roof. In California, uh, you have some uh, substantial s supplies of natural gas in the ground. Uh, What's the position of the administration, or do you know, on allowing uh, the research and exploration for these, uh, these reservoirs of natural gas to help create an increase in supply so that uh, uh, the cost can be going down? Um, I just speak for the, for the Public Utilities Commission or for myself as a commissioner. Uh -huh. And certainly the Public Utilities Commission has done everything in its power to increase capacity for natural gas in California and its storage. So, for instance, early last year... I'm not talking about storage. I'm talking about exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, the Public Utilities Commission doesn't do exploration, so... Well, I'd like to maybe have somebody address that question to the administration because uh, you have reservoirs of, uh, according to some geologists that we know, that in California of natural gas that could be tapped to, to increase the supply. <coughs> Let me ask one more question of uh, Mr. Madden from FERC. How much could the California... Uh, utilities have saved if they had not been prevented by the CPUC from entering into forward contracts. And can you give us uh, an answer to that uh, for sake of the record? I'll, get, I'll, I'll provide an answer. My answer I have already provided to the committee, but I need a, a back step so everyone will understand this. Um, when we had the restructuring in California, the CPUC required the utilities, for the most part, to divest their thermal plants and CT plants, and they kept their hydronuclear, except a couple here or there plants. I am were required to, and, and that was approximately 20 to 25,000 megawatts. And those plants were barred by numerous generators at premium prices, which helped the California utilities buy down their stranded costs. Um, as part of that structure, the utilities had to sell into and buy from the PX. Um, and as I uh, and I don't know for a fact, I, I, I assume Ms. Lynch knows better. There there is a per se prudence established in California that if you buy in the spot market, you're going to be per se prudent. And I also believe that there were some restrictions initially by the CPUC on utilities as to le the level or the amount of bilateral contracts they could have versus their overall portfolio. Uh, so essentially most of the market in California was in the spot market because there was very little, if any, bilateral forward contracts. It has increased today, I think it might be 10, maybe 15%. That compares to a number of other states, I must say, that never required the 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 excuse me the divestiture to the uh, of the utilities facilities. And if it did, it allowed the utilities to buy back the power for a certain period of time. So, with that perspective, let me try to answer your question. Now, if we look at, for example, an entity wanting to purchase a Ford contract last year, and the Ford contract, let's say, was going to start May, and they were looking for a price in April, 
they could, there is some transparency out for California. And what they can look at is what are the prices going for for the for next month, a 30 day service at Palo Verde or the California Oregon border. So, what we looked at is when responding to the question of the committee um, that the amount of the amount it would charge for a megawatt hour of electricity last April for May delivery was $32 a megawatt hour. Then we looked at the recent filing that the Cal ISO submitted dealing with the $6.2 billion. And they state for the May spot price, May spot price in California, they averaged it at approximately $58 a megawatt hour. So if you subtract the $32 that you could, could have paid from the 58 that the spot was going for, we arrived at a $26 megawatt hour differential. Now, if you take the load, you take the load of the transmission load in California, um, on a given day uh, in May, that day, you can approximate it's about 19 million, almost 20 million. So if you look at the 20 million that go, is on the load times the differential of 26, the difference between the 32 and the 58, for May alone, if the utilities bought on the spot for the delivery, we would have saved approximately $520 million for May. If I understand at the time in California, the power distributors were required to buy at the price set by the PX on any given day. So it might well have been the $58 price. I mean, their buy-sell requirement forced them into the PX to buy. Is that correct? Uh, uh, well, what happened was under the FERC rules, the highest price bidder, that price was paid to everybody, and that was the PX price. And now FERC has changed that rule somewhat by saying essentially up to $150, everybody gets the same price, and then you file some paperwork and you get a higher price. But at that FERC, point... FERC define the rules for the PX? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe Ms. Lynch is incorrect. We had a filing by the ISO, a tariff filing under Section 205 of the Act, um, you know, to implement the restructuring. The FERC reviewed that, received comments from the CPUC uh, and from other parties, who I believe also supported that, and I have to check the record to be, uh, to be absolutely sure. And it was that they were required to pay the market clearing price established at the PX at that time. Okay. But this was not FERC Loan. It was the submission by the ISO and, the, and support and comments from other entities. Now, Chairman Burton, I, I was also asked the committee to get an idea of if we look at a big city in California, how much could we save? Well, Secretary Abraham last, last month testified at the Senate hearing, and he noted that there was an offer, an offer now, by Duke to provide San Diego its entire load for a year at 55 megawatts an hour. Now, I don't know the terms and conditions of that offer uh, other than the price, and there may be some ad, you know, added provisions in it. But, you, but if you look at the load of San Diego, what its needs are, and you multiply that times the price that Duke was going to offer San Diego to meet its needs, San Diego alone would have saved Five billion dollars. Five billion, billion, billion dollars. dollars. Now this is, you know, somewhat hindsight. And I do want to make a comment that I, contrary to some on the panel, I do believe in a entities or IOUs having a mixed portfolio of contracts: spot, short, medium, and long. But just to get an indication that, and this is again based on hindsight, that had they done this. This is how much the consumer, the consumer, would ultimately save. Did you get all that, guys? Okay. Let me ask a few more questions, then I'll uh, 
let my colleague uh, from uh, California, Mr. Horn, uh, finish up. Uh, this is on the issue uh, that uh, FERC blew out the, the quote, blew out the price caps. Uh, Mr. Winter, on December 7th, you made an emergency request to FERC to relax the hard price uh, uh, cap. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Isn't it correct because uh, not enough bids were coming in, the system was going to collapse? That's correct. Going into this summer, we're being told that uh, there's a shortage of 3,000 megawatts. Uh, Mr. Winter, uh, what would happen under these circumstances if uh, FERC imposed a hard price cap? Would the threat of blackouts get worse or better? I think it would probably get worse because if the, if the price cap was below what other states could provide at their cost, mm -hmm. then we would end up being unable to get that power and therefore would have to uh, cut the load. Uh, Mr. Makovich, uh, would hard price caps produce more or fewer blackouts this summer? Uh, price caps, as currently set, uh, either soft or hard, are making it worse. So they're going to extend the hours of outages. And Mr. Madden, you want to answer that same question? I believe, and I can't get into specifics because the issue is before the Commission in a number of hearings, but I believe this, I believe this is my personal opinion, that hard caps do not provide the supply and the incentive for the need for power, for the need for generation. So your, your answer is pretty much That's the same as Mr. McAvich. Okay. Mrs. Lynch, uh, what would a hard price cap do this summer with a 3,000 megawatt shortfall? It's Ms. I'm not married. Um, okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Forgive me. I would join with uh, economists Frank Wallach from Stanford and Chris Woodruff from uh, Southern California and Josco and even Paul Krigman in the New York Times who say the price caps in a dysfunctional market where there's no competition are needed as a market mitigation measure. The problem here is folks withhold, the sellers and the generators withhold. And if you don't if you don't discipline the sellers, then they have no incentive not to withhold and then bid in right when the price gets to the very highest level. So even conservative economists like Paul Krugman of the New York Times saying in this market, with this level of dysfunction and market power evidenced, price caps are a necessity. But I would go farther and say, in fact, what we need is cost-based pricing. We need cost-based pricing as a market mitigation measure so that the sellers have to prove up their costs and then gain a reasonable profit rather than the many hundreds of times a profit that they're sucking out of the California economy. So you disagree with your colleagues at the table? Uh, certainly as to that effect, that's right. But I do agree with the vast majority of economists who have studied this market in particular. Well, uh, Jim, Chairman Burton, yes. could, could I add, um, the, as I noted in my direct testimony, the, the, the Commission staff has prepared a market mitigation plan uh, to go forward. And hopefully the Commission will bless that plan or, or approve some type of plan going forward in terms of addressing the current concerns of outages. Uh, the pricing at key key times, the need for confidential information from the generators, and the questions of uh, the requirement that generators be required to schedule if they and and provide the service if in fact they they have the megawatts. We are receiving comments on that. So the concerns that are being raised as to manipulation, withholding, market power are indeed going to be addressed in the very very near future by the commission. Wait, give me a time for I would say we are on schedule. The commission noted in the December order by May 1. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Horn. Uh, Ms. Lynch. Uh, uh, Ms. Lynch. Ms. Lynch. Uh, the latest, well, I called her president to start with. Is it a president or chairmanship? It's a president. President. We'll go back to president then. Uh, when was the latest increase uh, per kilowatt hour put at 3 percent? Did the commission do that? Uh, three cents a kilowatt three hour, cents which per was kilowatt hour. I wish it were 3 percent. Um, we voted an additional three cents on March 27th. On January 4th, we voted a one cent increase, which was on average a one cent increase is on average a nine cent or nine percent increase. How did you come to that determination? 
through an evidentiary record where we hired independent auditors to look at the utilities and their uh, affiliated companies' books and records, and then also allowed all parties an opportunity to present information about how much uh, was needed in order to buy power in California. Apparently, uh, it was issued, right? Yes. Okay. Now, did it result in $45 million a day being spent on purchasing electricity? Did it help do that? Well, whatever well, is spent cents. is spent in the California market. The question is, yeah. who is going to pay for that power purchase? And so what the commission did was say the rate payers of the investor-owned utilities in Southern California Edison and PG&E territory will bear the burden of paying the exorbitant wholesale prices to the extent of a, a total of a four cent increase on the kilowatt hour rate. Do you think uh, the explanation could also be that the uh, rate increase would be allocated between the state and the small generators and our own significant and uh, because the small generator generators really bothers a lot of us and uh, the obviously the utilities would get some of it, but uh, a lot of it would have uh, uh, been uh, to uh, get some money in the pot for everybody, I would think. Absolutely, Mr. Horn. And yeah. in fact, when we ordered the additional three cent rate increase, we also ordered the utilities to pay those small generators who weren't being paid. I was quite disturbed, and my colleagues as well, that the utilities had stopped paying those small generators who are so key and critical to our reliability needs. So they are starting to pay. We are, the order was, as of April 1st, you shall pay those small generators what is owed for the power, per, for the power produced by those generators. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up on something. If, Mr. Madden, if I understood you correctly, you said that FERC's jurisdiction extends to roughly half of the market in California? I don't believe I said half, but we have a substantial, we do not have a substantial amount of jurisdiction over the energy that's sold into California because of munis and co-ops. About 50 percent, we do not have jurisdiction over 50 percent of the market west-wide. Okay, I think Secretary Abram, is advised, Secretary Abram advised me that it was 47 percent non-jurisdictional in terms of the California market specifically. Uh, Chairman, I just don't have that figure. I, you have to look at how much energy is generated, and I just well, don't have it. It's, well, it's a substantial amount. It's 40 percent, maybe. I don't have the exact figure. Well, my real question is actually for Mr. Makovich, and that is that if FERC only regulates 40 to 50 percent of the wholesale power market in the western California picket, uh, what's the consequence of putting caps Right. On, that, on that portion of the market. Right. The uh, price caps are a very, very limited tool under the best of circumstances. If you can only impose it on half the market, uh, you're likely to create far worse distortions than any kind of gain you're going to get from these price caps. Um, as Terry mentioned, you're going to be giving people the incentive, for example, to move power to an area of higher return, to export it from California to Palo Verde to get a better return. And we saw that happen when we had these soft price caps in effect. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as, as I mentioned, the, there's a problem. 50 percent of the energy produced in the West non-jurisdictional to the Commission. Of course, the issue has come up in a number of dockets. I can't talk about the merits, but I can tell you my views on that. It's very difficult to put a cap, as you mentioned, only on half the market, and the other half of the market is not capped. We saw that problem with gas 15 years ago when we regulated the interstate side. I mean, did not regulate the interstate side, but re regulated the interstate side. And the interstate market, uh, side of the market went to the interstate side of the market. Uh, second of all, we have substantial <coughs> amount of bilateral contracts in the West. A substantial amount. And do you want to undo those contracts. You would have to if you had a cap, in, if in fact those contracts ex exceeded the cap. The third thing is you really don't have a spot market in the West as you do in California. So you don't have the control, you don't have the transparency you would need to do that. That said, 
you know, if a cap adds to or increases supply and decreases demand, maybe it's something you should look at. But that has to occur first. Ms. Lynch? Um, California did have price caps up until November 1st, and the ISO voted an effective price cap of $250 a megawatt hour last July. So it's not as if we haven't had experience with a market that actually worked somewhat under the prior caps. It's really the FERC's unprecedented action beginning with their draft order in November and then continuing and extending more and more that has caused this issue and, and the bleeding of the California economy at, because of these outrageous wholesale prices. But it did work before, perhaps imperfectly, but certainly much better than it works today with nothing. No protections for the California businesses or consumers. Comment. You may, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make one final comment. I think we're about through with this panel. We are. Yeah. It's apparent, I think, to anybody who's taking a hard look at this, you need more generation in this state, you need more power plants, and you need them online as quickly as possible. So I hope that there's something worked out between the environmental organizations in this state and uh, uh, the utilities and the government so that they can get on with uh, generating enough electricity to take care of the need because if you don't do that, this problem's going to get worse and worse and worse. I think that's what you what you made, isn't it, uh, Mr. Makovich? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank the witnesses for coming. It's been a long panel, and I apologize, but you guys have so much information that we'd like to glean from you. We could probably go another couple hours, but we won't. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you all for coming. We're going to take a five-minute recess, and then we'll have the third panel join us. What is the point you're trying to make? You're here for a while. I don't understand what you're trying to make. I don't know what you're trying to make. Yeah, what's your point? The point is very simple. I've seen you rewind. If I was you, I'd retire. Oh, really? The point is very simple. Get out of here. You must be sick. Stop building the system. 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 Stop bellying. We don't have enough energy to blame the environmentalists. This hearing continues with four more California energy officials. We'll show you that third and final panel in a couple of minutes. Coming up on C-SPAN 2, testimony on the environmental impact of the California energy shortage. Then you can hear from Pulitzer Prize winning authors in three categories. Joseph Ellis for history, David Levering Lewis for biography, and Herbert Bix for general nonfiction. And later, Charles Haynes of the Freedom Forum talks about freedom of religion. Tomorrow on Washington Journal, Guests will include Dennis Hayes, Earth Day Network.